BBC World Service. We present Kenneth Williams, Peter Jones, Clement Freud and Tim Rice in just a minute. And as the minute walls fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome uh, once again to Just a Minute. And uh, as you've heard, we welcome back Tim Rice to play the game with our three regulars. And they're all going to try and speak, not together, I hope. Uh, they often might, of course, on the subject that I will give them. And they're going to try and do it without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And we begin the show this week with Peter Jones. Peter, the subject is bliss. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Well, bliss is a state of mind which it's much, much easier to attain if you have a host of sympathetic friends and a fairly large bank account and are in superb physical condition, have a happy disposition, and are, generally speaking, ready to... Uh... <laughs> uh, Kenneth Williams has just... Yes, yes, I'm afraid the bliss was yes. slowly dripping away from him, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, Kenneth, I agree with your challenge, so you get a point for a correct challenge, and you take over the subject. And there are 37 and a half seconds starting now. The music of bliss has filled me with insatiable desire. I can't tell you. It's transported me. On the other hand, we all have to agree that bliss in terms of humanity is hardly ever realised because like retrospective things you see you only know. When you've done it, when you've got past it, do you see its value in terms of human happiness and the condition in which we are so continually placed is that of extreme adversity and things come along to alleviate our sufferings and therefore bliss will remain heavenly not attainable here upon this earth When Ian Messiter blows his whistle, it tells us that 60 seconds is up and whoever is speaking at that moment gets an extra point. It was Kenneth Williams. And at the end of that round, the only person to score any points is Kenneth Williams. <laughs> <laughs> and Kenneth, we'd like you to begin the second round. The subject chosen for you is making myself perfectly clear. Well, you've given us one example of that, but now will you talk on the subject... Starting now. I make myself perfectly clear in France. Uh, Clement Freud is challenged. Could you say that again? <laughs> What's this about? Well, it was a joke, actually, I think. And Never asking you to oh, say. I see. Did you get it? Making yourself <laughs> perfectly clear. <laughs> <laughs> I've just got it. <laughs> yes. Very good. Yes. Very good. Some of the audience are just getting it, too. <laughs> it's going round very slowly, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Kenneth, I disagree with the challenge the altogether, so um, you have another point. You're still the only person with any points in this game, which is most unusual. And there uh, are um, 57 and a half seconds to making myself perfectly clear starting now. I made myself perfectly clear in Paris, but... Uh, Tim Rice's challenge. Definite hesitation on the word perfectly. No, there wasn't. He was trying to do it in a very strange way. He's got another point, and there are 55 seconds left. <laughs> so, starting now. When I say to my French friends, Comment allez-vous? Vous avez le. <laughs> Tim writes the challenge. Two vous. <laughs> yeah. He said, Comment allez-vous? Allez and then vous. Vous avez. Oh, but vous, F-A, is different to the sound of vous because it's got an S on the end, isn't it? Well, they've no, both got an S on the end, but you pronounce one as vous and the other one as vous. Oh, I see. It's try the to, same Try word. to uh, deceive us, but um, I think Tim's uh, challenges are justified. Tim Rice, you have the subject. There are 48 seconds on making myself perfectly clear starting now. It is not often appreciated how important the order of words is if you wish to make yourself perfectly clear. For example, if I said making perfectly myself clear or perfectly clear myself making 
or even perfectly clear making myself, it would not be quite as crystally obvious what I was going on about as if I was saying what is on the card, and I am therefore allowed to say it as often as I like, making myself perfectly clear. I hope I have made myself perfectly clear on this one. If I have not made myself perfectly clear, then I invite listeners to write in... Uh, Clement Ford has challenged. 17 eyes. <laughs> In view of his manipulation of the rules, I think it's only fair to give it to Clement Freud and say, please take over the subject with 17 seconds, making myself perfectly clear starting now. Making myself perfectly clear is something which no politician ought to try, because the lunacy of elucidating people as to your intentions, or even of sitting next to Kenneth Williams, who is trying to make himself far less clear than anybody would have believed. Well, Clement Freud, speaking as the whistle went, got the extra point that time, and he's now in second place, ahead of Tim Rice, behind our leader, Kenneth Williams. And for those of you at home who listen without cosmic eyes and wonder what the laughter was while Clement was being serious, is because Kenneth was up to his tricks again, <laughs> sitting next to him, and he's still doing it now about me. Tim Rice, will you take the next subject? It is comics. Will you tell us something about those in a minute, starting now? Yes, I will take the next subject, which happens to be comics. That word conjures up a beautiful childhood. I remember Beano, Dandy, Eagle, Mickey Mouse. Some of the characters in that third periodical I mentioned included Dan Dare and his faithful Batman Digby, who travelled across space through the solar system, past Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, and all the satellites of that sixth planet out from the sun. Mimas and Thetidus, Tethys, uh, Diana... Clement Freud. Repetition of planets. Yes, you did say past the planets the first time, yes. <laughs> Clement, well, listen, there are 37 I know where my seconds on comics section. starting now. My favourite is Bunty, and particularly the Four Marys. <laughs> Uh, Tim Rice has challenged. I think Bunty's ceased publication, hasn't it? Well, it can still be his favourite. He may not be able to read it. <laughs> Nobody should be was Bunty in that case. Uh, this is libel. <laughs> <laughs> My friends at Bunty will have you for your... But before royalties. we give them any more publicity, let's say, Clement, you continue with 37... Sorry, 32 and a half seconds on comics starting now. The Four Marys are a quartet of disadvantaged girls, if you can believe the paintings or pictures which are depicted in the pages of that particular comic. And Miss Raleigh is actually my favourite because she is five foot two, has black hair, blazing blue eyes, and believes the headmistress, Mrs Gull, or doctor of that name, is more evil than she actually is. Clement Freud, in spite of being nobbled again by Kenneth Williams, manages to keep going. <coughs> the whistle went, gained an extra point, and has now taken the lead ahead of Kenneth. And Clement, your turn to begin. The subject, Creatures from the Deep. Will you tell us something about them in 60 seconds, starting now? The four Marys in Bunty are <laughs> as close to creatures from the deep as I ever hope to find. This children's magazine published most Thursdays, though occasionally... Friday, even if the news agent is tardy on a Tuesday, belong to a type of subspecies seldom seen in real life. Everything that occurs in the stories penned by the authors of DC Thompson Limited of Dundee, who are publishers, make one believe that nothing... Uh, Kenneth Williams, a chap. I don't think this is any relationship to... Uh, no, he's deviated. He's on to publishing and uh, got well away from the creatures from the deep, even though he tried to make a connection at the beginning. There are 25 seconds for that subject with you, Kenneth, starting now. One of the creatures from the deep that interests me is the whale which uses pilot fish to guide him through... Uh, Tim Rice has challenged. Whales hang around on the top, don't they? They don't go that far down. Sharks. What? Hang around on top. We don't hang around on top. <laughs> they are creatures of the deep. What are you talking about? Hang about. <laughs> they don't hang about. They, they do hang about on, on top, the top, but they also go down. Oh, no. But they don't go that far yeah. down, do they? 
Well, I, mean, I think the deep can be referred to, but you don't mean the deepest part of the deep. I mean, often you can refer to the sea. No, I, I think that, uh, Ken, it was an unjustified challenge. Well, if you didn't mean the deep, you'd say the ocean, creatures of the ocean, sure. Yeah, but in any well, case, well some said. people refer well to the ocean said. as the deep. I don't think, colloquially, th he's deviating from the subject. It's irritating, isn't it? <laughs> there are 18 seconds with you, Kenneth, starting now. The pilot fish that guided it, I was what I was talking about, now I've gone, I've gone right off. <laughs> Tim, I've gone right off. It's just ruined my flow. I've got no flow. <laughs> well, you must bring her with you next week. Oh, yeah. uh, Tim, you take over the subject. There are 13 seconds left. Creatures from the deep starting now. I was once given a long... Uh, Peter Jones a challenge. It always starts off, I was once. <laughs> <laughs> I was once, I was there. Well, it's all right. He hasn't said it before in this particular Quite round, so true. he's all right. So he has a point. He keeps the subject. Uh, Twelve seconds, starting now. Having been handed a long tentacled fishy thing by a friend, I said, what's this? And he said, it's the six quid I owe you, or something like that. This <laughs> is an extremely bad joke, which I hope is relevant to the title. <laughs> So the impact of his joke kept him going to the end and the audience as we all worked it out. The whistle went, he gained an extra point and Tim Rice is in third place behind Clement Freud. Kenneth Williams has taken the lead again and Peter Jones is now going to begin. The subject package, holidays. Uh, 60 seconds starting now. Well, I wish there were literally package holidays and by that I mean I would like to be put into a carton and boxed up and then lowered into the uh, fuselage of an aeroplane or whatever you call it and taken to uh, some foreign parts where my holiday would begin and then unwrapped carefully having had a, some kind of anaesthetic or tranquilizing drug for the course of the journey and I think that would be very restful and would in fact be a real a package holiday. Now the ones that I have uh, been on before have involved going to Vienna or Venice or somewhere, usually beginning with V, and um, <laughs> then... Yeah, what's the matter? <laughs> Tim Rice <laughs> What? I thought perhaps the buzzers had failed. No, no. <laughs> yeah. I, no, I think you were the one who failed, actually. Yes, I was. It wasn't right, quite your yes. scene, was it? Uh, Tim, you challenged. Hesitation. Hesitation. Yes, yes, I agree. There are 12 seconds. Package holidays starting now last package holiday that a friend of mine went on, not me, you note, was very unsuccessful in the... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. He didn't take you. <laughs> <laughs> a good try, Peter, but a wrong no, challenge. No, uh, no, but only not me. I mean, it seems so funny. No. <laughs> I don't know. The audience laughed. Seven seconds, package holidays, Tim, starting now. For a start, the shower didn't work in his bedroom. When he turned it on, sand came out, which is very irritating if you have just come in from a hot, sweaty round of golf. <laughs> Tim Rice gained the points in that round and he has taken the lead ahead of Kenneth Williams and Clement Freud. Peter Jones is trailing a little. Kenneth, will you begin the next round? Uh, an historical one for you again. Uh, David Hume, the one who was born in 1711. You tell us something about him in just a minute, starting now. An interesting aspect of his work is the cause and effect theory which he puts forward apropos what you necessarily see happening cannot be assumed to be happening if you do not bear testimony to the occurrence itself. Now, an example would be the billiard ball hitting another and cannoning the balls off, you see, would be... <laughs> thought of as cause and effect, because you'd say, well, that ball hit that other ball, and therefore... <laughs> Tim has challenged. No, I said balls. The other one was all balls. <laughs> and then, then I said, you're, try you're making it a bit sound a bit like that. You did actually say... <laughs> you did actually say ball three times. But it was time to get the cause and effect thing showing. You see, the ball hitting I'm... the ball means that they do think the first ball caused it, but it wouldn't necessarily be so if another ball hit a ball, which you weren't seeing doing. <laughs> I, I entirely see what you mean. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but I entirely see what you mean. <laughs> so, Tim, I agree with your challenge. There are 29 seconds on David Hume, the one born 1711, starting now. The David Hume I know about, born in 1711, was one of the first 18th century hang gliders and met a tragic <laughs> end in 1746 when overestimate... Uh, Clement Freud challenged. Here's a tish. Yes, I think so. Uh, Clement, 19 seconds on David Hume, 1711, starting now. 
David Hume, born 1711, was probably the first known atheist who was not punished for his beliefs. And uh, Tim Rice. What about Cain? Yes, with lots of them, lots of examples, yes. I mean, there yes, lots of examples, you're quite right. Yes, it's a very bad statement. It was a devious <laughs> statement. <laughs> when was Cain born? Uh, before that. Before 1711. Oh, yeah. Miles before. Yes. Uh, ten yes. seconds with you, Tim, on oh, come David on. Hume, born 1711. Yes, he accepted. Chairman's yes. rulings all oh. paramount. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely chairman. Starting now. <laughs> and Clement first. Cha- Hesitation. Yes, I agree. <laughs> So, Clement, you have the subject back on seven and a half seconds on David Hume, born 1711, starting now. To profess the lack of faith in the 18th century was, in fact, a very brave thing indeed. Uh, Kenneth Williams... Wasn't at all. A lot of people were doing it. (laughs) A lot of people were doing it, but to express that opinion, which David Hume... That's what Clement was establishing, actually. So he wasn't actually deviating from... No, of course he was deviating. He was saying, nobody dared. No, he never said nobody dared. Loud people were doing it. It was such a joke about him. They actually called it St David Street in which he lived. That was the joke. That was the whole point of it. That it was was received as a joke. If it had been what he said, nobody would have been dared making jokes about it. It would have been so profane and ghastly, would it not? Oh. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. <laughs> and I hope you feel better for it, too, because I actually, Clement, I don't think was... Uh, um, you can't digressing. even say it, can you? You're no, I, I, <laughs> I couldn't think of the word. It would have been a bath chair, then that chair. <laughs> <laughs> they wheel him in here at night, they wheel him in. Give him an injection before he starts. <laughs> Queen's Royal Jetty, thank you. <laughs> Air adrenaline flowing. <laughs> I'm afraid the, the injection must be wearing off. Even Peter Jones has dropped off. Yeah. No. <laughs> he has injections as well. So, Clement, I don't think you were deviating from the subject until there are three seconds on David Hume born 1711, starting now. He was 16 years old when George II came to the throne. <laughs> Clement Freud uh, got the extra point and others in that round. And at the end, uh, he is now in the lead alongside Tim Rice. But Kenneth Williams isn't far behind. Peter Jones is further. Uh, Tim, it's your turn to begin. The subject is irritating motorists. Will you tell us something about that subject in just a minute, starting now? One of the best ways to irritate fellow motorists is to drive at exactly 70 miles an hour in the fast lane of the motorway and wait till some twit, usually in a Ford Granada, starts flashing you from behind. <laughs> Move over into the next passage, the middle one, and speed ahead so he can't overtake you, and then go back into the aforementioned right-hand channel of this big, large wide road which began being built in 1958. The M1 was the first one. I remember it well being opened by Harold McMillan quite near my hometown of St Albans. That is just one way of irritating your fellow motorists. There are other simple ways like just making... Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged. Uh, we had way twice. You had what twice? Way twice. Way, yes. That's right. One way and another way. Yes, well listen Kenneth, there are 25 seconds on irritating motorists starting now. One of the ways is to do what Stanley Unwin always says about tripping... Uh, Tim Rice has challenged. Ways, you had a uh, lot of ways there. He said one way and he said ways, didn't he? Always. Way and ways. No. No? No, no, he didn't. No, no, he I didn't. was just very fed up with his challenge, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to get, no, out, get it out keep, of my system. He's keeping Stanley Unwin's name before yes, the public. Yes, you never allow your emotions to get the better of you. You must stay always cool, and like I am, I'm always <laughs> cool. <laughs> Kenneth, you have the subject. There are 21 seconds for irritating motorists starting now. You cry out to them, trip over to the ancient Grecian Sparkers where the wax or Ulysses stomach near the Adrome in order to pass siren safely with a luxury flat block, house in a and carry an <laughs> That will always... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Incoherence. That <laughs> <laughs> is not one of the rules of the game. Don't clap him. Shut up. Don't clap him. That is not one of the rules of the game. Are you making a new rule that you've got to be coherent? Is that one of your rules? Is that one uh, of your rules? Uh, I, I, have you got a challenge which is within the rules of the game, Peter? Um... Oh, well, well, look at him, look at him, look at the brain, look at him. It's a deviation. Incoherence is another way of saying it's uh, a devious. But well, if... I think what we do is give Peter Jones a point for a good challenge on incoherence, but we leave the subject with Kenneth Williams because... But that uh... isn't fair, that's not reasonable. Yeah, you see, there are things that are not in the rules that you still would not allow. For instance, Kenneth might walk over to you and hit you over the head with the, milk, with the uh, water jug. And uh, you wouldn't allow that, I'm sure, if you could avoid it. 
Well, I would still be able to allow it in the game. Because no, you wouldn't. You'd be it. unconscious, even more... <laughs> He, he might have been deviating from logic, but then we often do in this game, so let's leave it with him. But if he goes on much longer like that, I will have to go against him. Uh, Kenneth, you have 11 seconds for irritating motorists starting now. You take a balloon and put into it having blown up considerable. Uh, Clement Freud is challenged. Deviation. Why? He's now coherent. <laughs> he was always coherent, but it didn't make very much sense. Uh, Kenneth, you have another point and seven seconds on irritating motorists starting now. When the aforementioned balloon has reached... Uh, Clement Freud's challenge. Repetition of balloon. Yes. Clement, you've got him with three seconds on irritating motorists starting now. Jumping up and down with your clothes on is very likely... <laughs> So, Tim and Freud uh, getting in just before the whistle, gained an extra point and has just taken the lead, but he's only one point ahead of the person in second place now, who is Kenneth Williams, and he's only one ahead of Tim Rice. <laughs> so, uh, a keen contest, and Clement, your turn to begin, and the subject is what more people should do. An interesting subject, and can you try and talk on it starting now? What more people should do is cheer up Kenneth Williams, who looks desperately sad and unhappy and <laughs> miserable and bored and asleep and winds me up whenever I start talking. And if only more people would remember that he is a decent sort of chap who produces plays which occasionally <laughs> run... Uh, Kenneth Williams has chucked. This is devious, you see, is deviating the subject because the subject is what more people should do, and this is all about me, so it's not about people, is it? It's not a generality any longer become a particular. No. It's become a particular, right, but so he's still saying what more car, people should what do. What more people should do. What more people. More people, isn't it? Not, 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 okay, it really, the subject really. says what more people should do, and I think this is a very delicate uh, decision to make. So mm, once well, again, I will appeal to our audience. If you think that Ke uh, Kenneth's challenge is correct and we should stick to just more people should do and not make it personalised as Clement, then you cheer for Kenneth and you boo for Clement and you all do it together now. Boo! <laughs> I don't know why I ever bothered to put it to the audience when Kenneth's involved, because they always come out on your side, Kenneth. So you have another point. You've taken the lead alongside Clement Freud. You have the subject. What more people should do starting now? What more people should do is to become altruistic and become... Oh, I and what I Peter mean is that people should become altruistic. That's what I meant to say. Uh, more altruistic. That's yes. what I meant. I mean they should become altruistic. In losing themselves in the problems of others, they will find the salvation that they need. That's what more people should do. That's what I was trying to say. See my yes, point? Yes, See my yes. point? I was very anxious to get that out. I think it's totally important to get that out. You know what I mean? You get so much out on just yes, a Yes, you've got to let it all out, you see. <laughs> so, Peter Jones, good to hear from you again. And there are 34 seconds on what more people should do starting now. I think more people should relax and take life easily, not rush to keep appointments and uh, be subject to intense pressure. Take, as an example, uh, intent... Uh, Tim Rice has challenged. Uh, hesitation. Yes, there was a definite error, <laughs> I'm afraid. Fifteen seconds for you, Tim, on what more people should do, starting now. I think more people should go walking. There are so many beautiful counties in England through which people can stroll. For example, Derbyshire. There is a absolutely staggeringly impressive county. Uh, Clement Freud. Repetition of county. More counties, yes. And I, I county, did say yes. county the second time. County. <laughs> <laughs> um, but didn't you say counties the first time? Um, no. Does it no, matter? No. Yes, it does. <laughs> Four does... seconds. What more people should do, Clement, starting now? What more people should do is ride a bicycle and then they would be fitter and weller and better. <laughs> Clement Freud has taken the lead again at the end of that round. Uh, Kenneth Williams is still in second place, not far behind. Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. The Thank subject you. is herbal remedies. <laughs> Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? I viewed them with great scepticism until when a horrible protrusion appeared upon my thigh, a lady with whom I had really only a brief and nodding acquaintance <laughs> said why don't you try wrapping in root of marigold 
I said, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> I'll go and get an antibiotic. Everyone else does that. She said, I would ask you seriously to consider this treatment because it has proved efficacious for me in the past every time anything remotely resembling a boil or a pimple or pustule has appeared upon my lovely frame I said oh well I will have a go and within 24 hours to my astonishment it had gone down <laughs> Well, it does seem that when Kenny thinks the end of the show is nigh, he takes the bit between his teeth and finishes in style because he was not interrupted throughout one minute, so he gets a point for speaking as the whistle went and an extra point for not being interrupted. Two points in that round, Kenneth. And now to give you the final score, Peter Jones adding, as usual, luster to the occasion but not many points to his name. Tim Rice returning in triumph. Uh, gained a lot of points, didn't quite uh, get ahead of Clement Freud, but Kenneth Williams, stealing up from behind, overtook them all and is this week's winner. Well, a popular win, as you see, and if the Kenneth Williams fan club wants to come into the audience again, no doubt he will give the same value. But, uh, as I said, we have little time left, so let me quickly say thank you very much for tuning in. We hope that you've enjoyed the show at home and will want to do the same thing again next time when we play Just a Minute. Goodbye from us all. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. Present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Barry Cryer, and Graham Garden in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, this week we have as our guests, as you just heard, Graham Garden and Barry Cryer against two of our regulars, Clement Freud and Kenneth Williams. And they're all going to try and speak at different times, we hope on the subjects that I will give them, and they will try and do it without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And we'll begin the show this week with one of our guests. Barry Crow, can you tell us something about the subject of getting ice cubes out of the tray? There are 60 seconds starting now. Getting ice cubes out of the tray is a hazardous and wet procedure. My wife's house proudness, if expression such as that there be, leaves something to be desired. The last time I approached the refrigerator and opened the door, something inside closed it again. I gained entry to acquire some of the aforementioned uh, items from the plastic tray, squeezed, and they flew across the room, striking my wife in the ah. right eye. Uh, Graham Gardner's challenged. Oh, I'm sorry to do this, Barry. A uh, repetition of my wife. Yes, you did bring your wife in before. I mean, I know it's lovely to have Terry brought in as often as we can, but... We uh... Mormons are proud people. <laughs> <laughs> So, Graham Gardner, our other guest, has got in first with a challenge. So, Graham, a correct challenge. You take a point for that and the subject. Uh, 30 seconds are left. Getting ice cubes out of the tray, starting now. Getting the ice cubes out of the tray is a problem if you happen to have a tray made of metal because the frozen 
ice cubes in the tray tend to make the aforementioned receptor to call extremely, <laughs> and you don't get interrupted for bad pronunciation, Barry hesitation in the middle of a word. <laughs> <laughs> hesitation. No, oh, no, he was, was an African dialect. There, which is hesitation. <laughs> Barry, you have the subject back, to, and there are 13 seconds um, starting now. Getting the ice cubes out of the tray, be it metal or of any other substance, can cause injury and malaise to the person attempting such a risky enterprise. One <coughs> night... Barry Cryer speaking as the whistle went, which he a blows to tell us 60 seconds it up, gains an extra point, and uh, he has the lead at the end of that round. In fact, he and Graham Gardner are two guests, the only one to have scored, and the only ones to have spoken, actually, in the first round. So let's now hear from Kenneth Williams, and the subject is creating a disturbance. <laughs> something I know that you've never done and would never dream of attempting. But would you try and tell us something on the subject in just a minute, starting now? I've seen a lot of evidence of this, especially at meetings where illiterate fools who do not understand either the argument nor the tenor of the conversations that are trying to be held in these various multifarious organizations endeavour to interrupt and so ruin the meeting for everybody else. Now, I can only say that creating a disturbance in these conditions can only be called discourteous, rude, and ineffective insofar as any light or relief can be thrown upon indeed any subject. And all civilised people can only view it with dis. Favor, because to cause a disturbance in any civilised community... Uh, Graham Garden has challenged. Repetition of civilised. Yes, you didn't... Well, you can't have enough of it. <laughs> <laughs> civilised or otherwise. We Mormons are proud people. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well done, Barry. There are eight seconds on creating a disturbance for Graham Garden starting now. There are those who say that creating a disturbance is, in fact, with a frog in my throat, a physical impossibility. The disturbance... Graham Garden demonstrated that it was not a physical impossibility to create a disturbance with a frog in his throat. He kept going to the whistle when gained an extra point and is in the lead ahead of Barry Cryer at the end of that round. Clement Freud... Nice to hear from you. It's your turn to begin. The subject, undergraduates, will you tell us something about them in just a minute, starting now? Uh. And Kenneth Williams has challenged. It was hesitation, Alfred. It was. But we haven't heard from Clement Freud. We hope we will hear from him before the show is over. <laughs> and uh, yes. Kenneth Williams has got the subject of undergraduates, 58 seconds, starting now. In most places, they're looked upon as arrogant, and they charge around wearing the colours of the place to which they belong, and alienate the townsmen, as they refer to those who don't belong to their <laughs> august... Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Hello. <laughs> Also, no, repetition any... of belong. That's right, yes. A round of applause for hello and a repetition <laughs> of belong and 47, 43 seconds to continue. Sorry, to take over the subject of undergraduates starting now. I think one of the best japes of which I've heard was when a man went to the police station and said there are some undergraduates digging up Piccadilly Circus and I think you should arrest them. He then approached those same people who were in the process of excavating the Sour Affair, which I mentioned previously, and said there are some undergraduates who are dressed as officers of the law, and I think it is only fair for me to acquaint you with this information, and then stood by witnessing one of the great fights of all time. <laughs> I think that's the sort of undergraduate behavior which we in this country have come to believe Boy, keeping going on the subject of undergraduates uh, until the whistle went, uh, for which he gets an extra point. 
um, is now in second place alongside Barry Cryer at the end of that round. Graham Garden in the lead and Graham to begin the next round. Taking a Turkish bath. As a matter of fact, I have never in my life <laughs> taken a Turkish bath. And if I were to do so, I would put it back at once. The idea of uprooting the entire edifice, dragging it down the street by means of some mobile conveyance, be it motorized or self-propelled in whatever way, and then trying to fit the thing into my living room at home makes my mind, if you will excuse the expression, boggle. And so that is the reason why Turkish baths have remained unmolested by me for many a year. I won't tell you how many 12 a monthly periods I refer to, but it certainly is a goodly sum. However, I have in the past taken a different sort of bathing apparatus, namely a slipper of that ilk home under my arm and found it not at all difficult. Larger... Graham Garden, demonstrating his excellent use of words in many different ways, uh, kept going through 60 seconds, gets the point for speaking as a whistle went, and a bonus point for not being interrupted. Congratulations, oh. not many guests have done that, Graham. You're oh, strongly you. in the lead at the end of the round. Barry is going to begin the next round. You bath in the front room. Oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes. yes, it's interesting to visit his home, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. Jumps from the slipper bath into yes, the Turkish indeed. and then out to the conventional. Indeed, I'm yes. a bath collector. I never bathe my slippers. They get soggy. They're so... <laughs> I never bathe my Turks, either. The, um... Hypnotism... <laughs> know, your own bus... know your own business best, I'm sure. <laughs> the subject, Barry, for you is hypnotism. Will you tell us something about that without putting us to sleep in just a minute, starting now? <laughs> Silence is an integral, or indeed integral, minus or minus part of hypnotism. Mr. Mesmer, the pioneer, if not the originator of this technique, used a silence thus. <laughs> and Sherman Freud challenged. Repetition of the silence. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Clement. Uh, a clever challenge and well-deserved point and 44 seconds for you to take over hypnotism starting now. I did once actually go to a hypnotist who was a seedy gentleman in an upstairs room in Harley Street. And I called upon him because I have a smoke allergy and thought he might be able to help. The man put me under a spell very properly and decently and then reiterated over and yet again <laughs> that I didn't really mind tobacco and went on like that. Actually, it helped. I was able for a few weeks after that meeting to sustain the smell of the odious weed, which I've always been very unkeen on, but I then succumbed, went back, and unfortunately... kept going successfully till the whistle went, gained another point and uh, is now in the lead alongside Graham Garden. Interesting to be hypnotised to get used to smoking. Most people go there to lose the habit. Um, Kenneth, the subject is for you and it is the art of writing. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? It has been pronounced upon most wondrously by a gentleman. I shall not tell you who I've got in mind, but provide you with a few clues on the way. When he says that it is plain speech which should be transmitted through the writing so that it shall be immediately communicable to even the most unscholastic uh, here. Uh, Graham Garden has challenged. Yeah, I think I can guess it's Fowler. <laughs> <laughs> no, what? Actually, you're completely wrong. It's plain words by Sir Ernest Garrow. That was my second guess. 
<laughs> well, anyway, you've slowed the whole thing down now because I've got completely out of my flow. Well, I mean, I was just underway, wasn't I? You know, I was coming on to a very, very important well, thing. Well, grab flow again and get back with it. Graham Garden gets a bonus point for a nice challenge and you get a point for being interrupted and there are 31 seconds on the art of writing starting now. He instances the misusage of the plural by quoting from Shakespeare there is pansies and says we must remember that the lady saying it wasn't herself at the time. <laughs> now, of course, we do know that it is the mad scene that he is referring to, where the poor girl, laden with blossoms and various herbal remedies, is accused by the boy of being... <laughs> Williams, in spite of an interruption, kept the subject throughout the round, gained two points in doing so, is in third place uh, just behind Clement Froy. Graham Garden is in the lead, and Clement, your turn to begin the subject, Chad. Will you tell us something about Chad in just a minute, starting now? Chad is a character who was very much more in evidence at one time than he is now, who has a longish nose and two arms protruding over a wall, usually, with a message of the kind of what, no, thereafter follows a noun, verb, even adjective, at the discretion of the illustrator or author of the graffito in question. It's also a country in Africa, which I remember particularly well from covering Olympic Games, where Chad was represented usually by only one man, who, if I remember correctly, was not only an athlete, but also the Minister of Sport for that <laughs> country. He carried the flag, was a noble gentleman of at least six foot, great stature, and I have been to most continents, including Asia, Europe, South America, but when I went... took the subject. Barry Cry, you challenged just as the whistle went. What was your challenge out of interest? Uh, it was too late, and I've discarded it. And in what fact, I've forgotten what it was. Yes. I think on the grounds of taste, I will just abandon it. Right. Well, um, Clement Freud uh, achieved the difficult feat of keeping going without being interrupted, has two more points, and has now taken the lead ahead of Graham Garden. And Graham, your turn to begin. The subject, Humpty Dumpty. Will you tell us something about him in the game starting now? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the aforementioned <laughs> monarch men. <laughs> oh. All. Uh. Oh. Clement, 50 seconds on Humpty Dumpty starting now. Couldn't put Humpty Dumpty <laughs> together again. Uh, Kenneth Williams challenge. Oh, it seems hesitation. It me. was a hesitation. 45 seconds for you on Humpty Dumpty starting now. Well, there's a charming little nursery rhyme about this figure that sits on the wall. It's often being depicted as a sort of egg-like thing. And I had a friend who was known as Humpty because of this appearance. People used to say he's like a terrible old boiled egg, isn't he? Uh, uh, uh Graham Garden challenge. A repetition of egg. Yes, as right, uh, Graham, you have 30 I seconds. I said egg-like first time, which is actually not a repetition, you see, because, I mean, egg-like is in actual fact hyphenated. I know, but you use the word egg, and Graham uh, picked up the repetition of it's egg. It's all different. Oh, it's all different, is it? Yes, you notice that, Clement. Do you notice that? Just because they're guests, they're ganging up, you see. This is where the old faithful, the uh, week in, week out. These are a couple of guests to be given special privileges. You see, that's what they're after, isn't it? Giving them privileges. Not really, around them. You're the most sycophantic chairman I've ever known. <laughs> <laughs> in one game, in one game, you couldn't even do it. You remember that week when he couldn't even find a card? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, 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 he's punch drunk. That's his job. That's about three jobs in one day, you know. I'll he's tell you what, they were in. so impressed with how I couldn't find the cards that most of those people have come back. <laughs> yes, they if I was going to lose them this week as well. You inspire a strange loyalty, don't you? <laughs> yes. You're watching a family at war. <laughs> <laughs> and that proves the point. If I was sycophantic, I'd be buttering up to them. But I'm not. I'm giving... Uh, um, I'm on... <laughs> you don't know what... Uh, uh, 
Are there any other new rules that we ought to know about? <laughs> it is not a new rule. I'm just demonstrating my generosity. One of the men who's taken my name in vain more times on television than anyone else and now has the subject of Humpty Dumpty back again. And there are 30 seconds starting now. Humpty Dumpty began his life as a children's poem or riddle. And the people listening to this little verse were supposed to guess the nature of Humpty Dumpty by the clues within it. Hence, when we come to the phrase about Humpty Dumpty falling to pieces and not being able to be reassembled, <laughs> then that is referring to the impossibility of uh, reconstructing repetition of referring. Yes, I think mm. you start off on something which you couldn't help repeating yourself, Grant. I think I did. He yes. painted himself into a corner. <laughs> there are two and a half seconds on Humpty Dumpty with you, uh, Clement, starting now. This was actually a prediction. Uh, Graham Garden challenge. Minimal hesitation. <laughs> <laughs> A very good challenge. It wasn't a, hesi a minimal hesitation. Yes, a very good challenge. Yes, a minimal hesitation to Graham Garden. Humpty Dumpty. Half a second, starting now. Humpty. And <laughs> Barry Cry did try to get in on a minimal minimal, but he failed. <laughs> right. So uh, Graham, you've increased. You haven't increased your lead. You're now equal in the lead with Clement Freud at the end of the round. But Barry Cry is beginning the next round. The subject is my worst public mistake. Will you tell us something about it, Barry, in just a minute, starting now? My worst public mistake is happening now. I am <laughs> currently experiencing the miasma of lack of thought, obtuseness, denseness, call it what you will, as my organs seize up around my body in a steady sequence, deciding that they themselves will have none of this horrendous incident which is taking place before the eyes and ears of dozens of people as I sweat, I lose breath, I palpitate, I shake as I perform this abysmal farrago before the tolerant public of this great metropolis. Uh, Clement Freud's challenge. Arrogance. <laughs> <laughs> And what else in the game? He did say I 19 times. I know. <laughs> he is a guest, I expect. There's <laughs> some new rule. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suffer from eye strain, I'm sorry. Uh, well, he did say I far too many times. I tell you what, we've been generous to our other guests. I'll be generous to this uh, guest, Barry oh, yes, Crowe. Yes. And that will <laughs> even it up. Yes. We give Clement I'm Freud sorry, a bonus point for a superb challenge. And uh, he increases his lead, but Barry keeps the subject. My worst public mistake, Barry, could you arrogantly continue for ten seconds starting now? One is undergoing the most frightening experience uh, of... Uh, Ken Williams, Excuse me, because he keeps on about his frightening experience, and how this is the worst thing that's happened to me in public. I don't believe a word of it. These people here are not frightening at all. They're very charming and... They're cowering in their seats as you speak. Uh, so I... Yeah. I quite agree with your challenge of repetition of experience, uh, Kenneth. Deviation. Because he, wa he wasn't deviating. Deviation, you, stick to, you stick to repetition. And you have the subject of, with four and a half seconds to go, starting now. My worst public appearance was at Boscombe when my costume... Kenneth, you have a point for speaking as the whistle went. Would you like to continue your worst public experience? No, it's just that the costume came off, but it was a child's play. It wasn't. I mean, it wasn't a professional performance, so that, therefore I don't count it professionally as a, as, a, as a black mark against myself. No, it wasn't very funny, was it? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't very funny, but then neither are you. You're still chairman, we can read out. Fortunately, I'm not paid to be. Aren't you? Oh, no. you could have fooled me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not paid to be chairman. Oh, no. Yeah, I've heard he is oh, paid to be I'm not chairman. paid to be a funny <laughs> chairman. I've heard he's not very well out of it, too. Pointing it in, I'm too. <laughs> Having a new bathroom put in. Of <laughs> 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 ceramic. Avocados. Avocados, ceramic. Can you believe? Yeah. That white lavatory's been good enough for me for years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the bathroom for years. Yes. Yeah. 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 Y
expectation of these people. They get out, go on in the get up in the world and they start, you know, and I ask myself, how does he do what he does and what he gets? That's what I ask myself. <laughs> do I get any answer? No, I don't. If you notice he's mute, she's gone quiet. Look, I'm quiet. There, yeah, wipe the sheet. Look, he's gone white. Look. Yeah, it's a guilt. No, no, when, when I hear a comic genius at uh, play, I oh. let him go. Oh. I let the audience enjoy it and have oh. the full value of your wit, your humour, oh. your erudition, your talent and your charm. Oh, and about your tongue, I'll get blood poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, at the end of that round, after your rudeness, <laughs> which the audience enjoyed, we all enjoyed actually, um, that's why we ask you back. If you couldn't be rude to Nicholas Parsons, I don't know who else can. Kenneth, you are in second place. Training two points behind mm-hmm. our joint leaders, Graham Garden and Clement Freud. Barry Crow is a little way behind of the course. ball. And uh, Clement begins the next round. The subject, my favourite sport, starting now. I really wish I knew what my favourite sport was, because as you pursue sporting activities, you tend to favour one and then another. Cricket in 1943 was definitely my favorite sport. I kept wicket, batted, and occasionally, with my pads on both legs, bowled, although at that time the guardian of the bales was another player because you can't do one thing and the other at the same time unless you play the sort of sport which I have never attained to qualitatively. Football. I have much admiration for Plymouth Argyle above all teams. Fills me with pleasure and delight. Uh, Barry Crow has... Deviation shot. from the truth. Admiration of Plymouth Argyle. He's over the... 35. <laughs> wicked. <laughs> but sincere. That's a rotten thing to say. Yeah, actually, you could have had him... There were 21,000 to... people at Hume Park the other night. Although Were they playing at the time? No, no, actually, Barry, to be fair, within the game, he can talk about having admiration Plymouth Argar. I'm going to give you it's, a bonus. It's a very, a very it's good challenge. A very good challenge. But what got me was a... <laughs> well, we're not really interested in what gets you. Can it describe him at all? At the moment, the audience <laughs> are con- <laughs> convulsed uh, as the order. <laughs> Because Kenneth Williams has subsided under the table <laughs> with some form of apoplexy due to the... Apathy, mate, no apoplexy. <laughs> I was talking up with boredom at the whole dreary recital of your sporting activities and this rubbish about parks and these terrible yeah. places where the games are played. But you should have had him for deviation he when he talked about bowling with his pads on. But nobody spotted it. So, Clement, you still no. have the subject of my favourite sport. Fifteen seconds, starting now. Breathless hush in the close tonight tend to make in a match to win a bumping pitch and a blinding light an hour to play in the last <coughs> man. And Kenneth Williams has challenged. Repetition, wasn't it? What? He said hour to play twice. No. no. Nor did Newbold. Yes, you did. You said tend to play. Or say That's right. Didn't the Newbold didn't say it either. No, no, he was quoting there. He didn't say to play twice? No, no, no. Oh, well, I'm mistaken. It sounded very much like a repetition to me. <laughs> so, Clement, you keep the subject, and there are um, seven seconds left. My favourite sport are starting now. Real tennis, as practised at Hampton Court, Lord's Cricket Ground, Oxford, and the Rackets Club of New York. <laughs> a very loud applause for Clement Freud because you're going to have to pat him again in a minute because it's now reached the end of the show so I'll give you the final score. Uh, Barry Cryer returning again uh, (laughs) to Triumph where he triumphed before did finish in a different position. You were third last time, you were fourth this time. Uh, But uh, Kenneth Williams finished in a very strong third position. I've seen him do that before. And Graham Garden, who hasn't been with us in this series before, did extremely well. Nearly, nearly won at one point, but just was beaten in the end by our winner once more in just a minute, Clement Freud. <laughs> we do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute, and we'll want to tune in again same time next week when once again we take to the air and we play this impossible game. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye.
The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. Present Kenneth Williams, Peter Jones, Barry Took, and Tim Brooke Taylor in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hello, and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And once again, I'm going to ask our four panellists to try and speak if they can on the subject I give them without hesitation, repetition, or deviating. And we'll begin the show this week with uh, Peter Jones. And Peter, the subject, an ideal one for you, striving for perfection. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? Well, that's something that I've been doing most of my life, but I must confess I have never achieved it. I know you're all going to contradict me, but... <laughs> and Tim Brookdale a challenge? No, we're not. <laughs> A bonus point to Tim Brooke Taylor, but as Peter wasn't properly deviating from the subject on the card, he continues with 50 seconds on striving for perfection starting now. I think it's something everybody should do instead of sitting back like many actors do on a plateau of mediocrity, instead of striving every day with each performance to improve it and hone it, polish it to a degree of perfection that the like of which has never been seen. <laughs> uh, Tim Brooke Taylor, Jared. I hate to interrupt because it sounded so beautiful, but there was a lot of hesitation. Uh, there was. Well, it mm. was when the hesitation started, the beauty seemed to pall a little, I thought. So, uh, Tim, you have a correct challenge, so you get a point for that, and you have 29 seconds. You take over the subject, striving for perfection, starting now. Sadly, we will never reach perfection in one lifetime. It takes several to reach this state of perfection. So I would settle for the very good. I would like to be in this particular state in so many different fields of endeavour as an actor, as a writer, as a mountaineer, or even as a television... <laughs> and Barry, <laughs> Barry Took has challenged. A uh, hesitation. Yes. I've, I've got to accept that. I actually yeah, it definitely was. Very good. Was very good. Well, you also know that there were five uh, repetitions of as, <laughs> which I think is going too far, a small word even. Twelve seconds on striving for perfection, Barry, starting now. I strive for perfection every morning. I simply look into the mirror and say, it's all happening, but not here. <laughs> My days of striving to perfection are over. When Ian Messiter blows his whistle, that tells us 60 ah, seconds. Ah, is ah, ah. I beg your pardon. Uh, that hard work with Basil for the, Brush. <laughs> the people at home was Barry Took. We don't know what's the matter, but I think Kenneth Williams is working him again. They're sitting beside him. Uh, Barry was speaking as the whistle went, so he gains an extra point for doing so, and he has the lead at the end of that round one ahead of Tim Brooke Taylor and Peter Jones. And Kenneth Williams begins the next round. Kenneth, the subject is fools. Will you tell us something about fools in the game starting <laughs> now? Out of the mouths of babes and fools, and fools rush in where angels fear to tread, and few are aware of what comes before. Fools in Shakespeare are variously named. One that comes to mind is Festy, who cries out when, and I was but a little tiny boy, with hey-ho the wind and the rain, a foolish thing was but a toy, and what a responsive chord that strikes in all our breasts. 
Jesus, is it not? I can see you, sir. He's gone quite white. Yes. <laughs> your early childhood. And how these wonderful poetic thoughts that possess us and cast our mind back to an era which was nothing to do with mechanics, nothing to do with industry. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Repetition in every sense of the word of nothing. <laughs> <laughs> A note of asperity there. <laughs> is there acrimony there? Uh, I'll come over there and, there... And, 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 and give you one. <laughs> <laughs> Has there ever been anything? A, a bunch um, of five. I'll take your coat off. <laughs> uh, Peter Jones. <laughs> Peter, you had a correct challenge, and you have nine seconds to take over the subject of fools starting now. There always has to be at least one in every community, every company of people. Uh, always uh, Tim Brooke Taylor challenge. Uh, it seems a silly one, but every. Yes, every is not a silly one. No, oh. that's uh, not a little tiny word. Tim, you've got him with three seconds to go. Fools starting now. My first dramatic performance was as Festy, and I didn't understand... The So, Tim Brooke Taylor, speaking as the whistle went, then gained the extra point, and he has the lead at the end of that round. Uh, Barry Took, will you begin the next round? The subject is TV frights. I get frightened every time I appear on television because my memory went some years ago. I find it a great difficulty to actually remember <laughs> things that come so naturally to brilliant artists like Peter Jones, Tim Brooke Taylor, <laughs> Kenneth Williams, not to mention Nicholas Parsons, who gets almost every name right. It's quite extraordinary, <laughs> this amazing gift, this perfect sense of performance, timing, flourish, waving of the hands in the appropriate way. Consider the lilies, they cry, don't they? <laughs> Many is the day we have Tim considered Taylor them. challenged you. Hesitation. Yes, I know. Is that rotten? It was a beautiful, dramatic pause, but it was hesitation. And I'm I was sorry, making Barry. it up as I went along. I didn't know. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether he'd started or not, too. Did he have an... Well, I didn't of... actually say now, nah, but he went into such a magnificent flow, I couldn't interrupt him and uh, pull him back for the now. So uh, there are 27 seconds for TV frights with you, Tim, starting now. My worst TV fright was a filming of the goodies where I had to appear to be dragged along the ground by a little kitten. Now, this was done by means of a quick reaction from a camera going click, click, click very slowly as I moved in. And uh, Barry took his challenge. Click, click, Rep click is repetition, I would say. Uh, yes. <laughs> you were very I have to say that. It's good of you. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It's a good, good. You I couldn't very well argue. I wanted it. to hear what happened. Yes. I, I, I actually, I well, I'll go, er, uh, and then he'll get it back, and then you'll hear. No, he can tell us before yes. he says, er, uh, what no, happened no, I might. You really don't have to worry again. about the rules now. What actually happened after that? I might get it back again. All right, then. All right, you may never get it back. So there are 14 seconds with Barry on TV Fright starting now. TV Fright. Uh, Tim. I just want to get it back. <laughs> <laughs> that was hesitation, I'd say. It wasn't hesitation, but well tried. Give him a bonus point. He's a good player. And uh, Barry keeps the subject. 13 seconds starting now. Are you ready, Tim, as I talk about TV Frights? I'm about to go, uh. uh Tim <laughs> Taylor has jumped. Hesitation of a gentlemanly nature. <laughs> He actually said he was going to go earn uh, went uh, so really he didn't hesitate, but all right, we give it to you, Tim, because that's what they all want. Nine seconds, TV frights, starting now. Inch by inch, I went forward. The uh, Peter Jones. <laughs> I think I'm the most stupid man. Right, deviation of feet, was it? Um, yes. <laughs> it's just so exciting, this story. I just... <laughs> Mr. Jones, you have it uh, for seven seconds. TV fright starting now. Well, I suppose. Uh, Tim Brooke Taylor challenge. I still want to tell you something. <laughs> Peter Jones has another point for six oh. and a half seconds. TV fright starting now. The very worst things that can happen to anybody have already happened, so I know that there is nothing that could be more terrifying in store for me. Jones got the extra point. He's now in second place behind Tim Brooke Taylor. Do you want to tell us the rest of the story, Tim, or are you going to keep us in suspense? It might come in later. <laughs> right. If you bring up a subject that has something to do with TV fright. <laughs> I'll do my best. But they were written out before the game started, actually. Giant kittens would do. <laughs> <laughs> Giant kittens. 
If you're being general in your time. I think he's being very clever, actually. He's keeping the audience and the viewers and listeners in a state of animated suspense. Not many suspense. viewers, actually. <laughs> oh, yes. No, yes, definitely. Because once just a minute is on, everybody switches their television off. There are 60 seconds for mail order, Tim, starting now. My mail order business takes place with an automobile association, but the different type of mail order is where you send away for a mail. Now, this can come in several different sizes. It can come in large, medium, and small. <laughs> I'm talking, of course, about sweaters. These are for men of large caliber. <laughs> <laughs> men who hesitate, fell about laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the large caliber men, and he yes. talks. <laughs> And um, he's banging the chair now, having given up <laughs> knocking the table. I know, he's a very difficult panellist. He bangs the table, we stop him doing that, then he refuses to finish something when I ask him to, and now he bangs the chair. The chair. Now he's great bangs before the chair. it went stereo. Have you noticed? In the old days, you could bang a microphone, it was quite happy, but now it's in stereo, you can't bang. I know, no, I sad, know. Sad. But the bang in stereo is far worse than <laughs> in mono. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kenneth, we come to you at this moment, and there are 36 seconds... <laughs> on the mail order starting now. The mail order of precedence has always determined the genealogical outcome of so many of the great families of England that it's almost bewildering when you look at the number of names come down to us historically through posterity and there we see the son, the scion, eldest member always given proper precedence. I'm right behind it because I think the eldest of the male line should take well, that precedence. <laughs> So Kenneth Williams got another point for the challenge and another point for speaking as the whistle went and is still in fourth place. He, but he is only one behind Barry Took, who's one behind Peter Jones, and Tim Brooke Taylor is still in the lead. Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. The subject, the Victoria and Albert Museum. Will you tell us something about it in the game, starting now? A joyous day was spent by myself in the V&A. I was delighted to see that astonishing reproduction of the Michelangelo Apollonian David. In all its noble proportions, beautifully lit, I might add, very subtle lighting they've got in that place. Beautiful designer, he must have been. I stood gazing in wonder, my mouth literally agape. For I'd always imagined one would have to go not to the Victoria and Albert, but to Venice itself to see this wondrous piece of sculpture. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. I thought it was in Florence. <laughs> you are a great fool. They've got another one there. I've got another one in Venice, you great fool. Haven't you ever seen it? <laughs> we have another one Reproductions in of it all over Italy. I know, but the one you were referring to, the original, was in Florence. So, Peter, you have a correct challenge and you have 19 seconds. And I'm not going to be bluffed out of these things. Uh, you do very well, Kenneth. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> and maundering on. Look at him. Peter, 19 seconds. The Victoria and Albert Museum starting now. It's a wonderful place for an assignation. While you're awaiting the person... Uh, uh, Kenneth Williams... This is a family show. We don't want a load of filth. <laughs> about meeting assignations and filth going on. It's I don't want to hear these people have come alive. Come all the way from Great Portland. I don't come here. <laughs> this kind of filth. Assignations. Do you, you want to hear this kind of rubbish? No, I don't. Certainly not. It's it's disgusting. You came from Great Portland. Yes. Uh, very respectable. If that's the way your mind runs, that every assignation should be filthy... What, is a museum? So... A museum for seeing the great relics of the past? And he's talking about assignations? It could be a... Beautiful. Deviation of the worst kind. It could be a beautiful and delicate assignation. And I'm sure it was in Peter Jones' case. Do you want to go somewhere, Barry? I must tell the listeners he has his hand up at this present moment. We haven't got much longer to go. The show will soon be over. Can you wait? I've just gone deaf. <laughs> That is because he sits next to Kenneth Williams, uh, for those of you who can't see. So Your mother said Peter you Jones. always would, didn't she? Uh, Sorry. Back to the game. There are 14 seconds. The Victoria and Albert Museum starting now. Your date, Kenneth, might be 
some uh, thing from the past. Uh, Tim Brooke Taylor's challenge. Hesitation. Yes, you see, yeah. when you get upset by Kenneth Williams like that, yes, you get I in know. a state and you cannot contest Hopeless. you. Right, uh, Tim, you had a correct challenge. There are 11 seconds. The Victoria and Albert Museum starting now. The largest and possibly the greatest museum in Europe was how it was described today. A friend of mine produces diaries for the Victorian... And, <laughs> and uh, Barry Took has challenged. Hes hesitation. Hesitation is he right. He couldn't even say it. He can't. Well, I know he can't say it. Right, fair enough. I must still have a correct challenge. Uh, you have two seconds, very cleverly, Barry, with the Victoria I'm... and Albert Museum starting now. I love the Victoria and Albert Museum because it has a kind of... So the score once again, Barry took an extra point, speaking as the whistle went, he's now equal with Peter Jones in second place, one behind Tim Brooke Taylor and Kenneth Williams trails behind them. Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin. The subject is parking, 60 seconds starting now. Well, it's what all the motorists in London seem to be trying to do. I think it would be great. Uh, Kenneth Williams... Deviation is a ludicrous statement. If all the motorists in London did it, the place would be quite impossible. Well, it's ludicrous. It's a daft situation. I mean, it just can't happen. It's devious. No, they're not all Don't to argue do it. with me. I've just said it can't happen. <laughs> and look at the studio. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Why Kenneth. didn't you invite me here at all? Why did you invite me here? That's what I want to know. Why did you invite me here? Yes. Kenneth, next time I... Next I to book Van Gogh to sit next to you. <laughs> Kenneth, I was agreeing with you. You oh, don't I... listen. <laughs> I'm sorry. You... <laughs> As somebody I've heard say to me before now, you great nit! Oh, Wait, listen, you are correct. You have yes. the subject. Ah. And there are 54 <laughs> seconds on parking starting now. It's something we have to find room for. Otherwise, of course, we shall give it the seams. Now, one of the best methods is to have the multi-story car park because you can then get in and out with ease and not affect any of the pedestrians. I feel we don't give enough attention to those who are using their own two feet to get around, and how much better the world would be if we had a little more thought for those dear people. Uh, Tim Brooke Taylor, Chuck. Deviation, we Yes, mm. yes, you're now onto people on two feet and not parking. Well, you, you can park two feet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you hadn't established that. A very quick reply, but you hadn't established that in like the game. The week's appeal to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's... <laughs> Say it again, Peter. It was a good line. But I no say, one... it sounds like the weak's appeal. And in any case... A very uh, weak appeal, I why think. This, <laughs> why this prejudice against one-legged people? <laughs> <laughs> I would have thought deserved more consideration rather than less. Mm. Yes, Tim, I, I still agree with your challenge, and you have the subject of parking. 25 seconds left, starting now. Parking is a thing that suffers greatly from people who are anxious to keep London free of traffic. Now, I think if the way to go about it must be to have fines much larger than they are at present. It is worth parking on a yellow line because you know that you will not be given a great big penalty. It must be increased to a great amount so people don't come into London and uh, think uh, they Peter can get Jones away. Sorry, this is the next you. week's good cause. Repetition of people. Yes, and great, yes. Excellent. Peter, you got in with four seconds to go. No, oh. three seconds to go oh. on parking. Make it two. Make God. London into a vast pedestrian precinct. That's the answer. Uh, Barry came in just before the whistle. Well, I can't see the connection between a pedestrian precinct and uh, the act of parking. Yes, because then the cars won't be allowed in here and they'll have to park outside. What a good idea, Peter. I withdraw my challenge. Right. So, Peter, you have the subject still with half a second parking starting now. Put the car. And Tim Charles. <laughs> Well, at the end of that round, Peter Jones gets an extra point as the whistle goes, and he's now one ahead of Tim Brook Taylor. Barry Cryer is just behind, and no, he isn't. <laughs> Why do you keep calling him Barry Cryer? Everyone knows it's Barry Took. 
Abby. Well, it's no. terrible, isn't it? Adjective. Well, Barry Cryer's been on the show so often, and Barry Took, I'm very sorry, uh, Mr. Took is one of our finest uh, um, script writers and presenters on television. He's also a journalist. He writes reviews. Barry Took is a marvellous man. Barry Took yeah, has yeah. been on Just a Minute and done so well. Barry Took is the name. Barry Took. <laughs> T-double-O-K. What's I wrong with you all? And I must say, I think it was very good of Gregory Parsons to give me that. Yes. <laughs> Quite nice. Quite nice. Nice. Yes. Nice yes. Well, somebody nice. said to me in the street that they said, Oh, I recognise you. My, oh, Nicholson Parkinson. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... I'd like to put in a word for Barry Cryer, who I think is very good as well. Yes, but he's not with us today, and I keep uh, well, bringing his disembodied thing. presence uh, so forward. So the hell with him. <laughs> <laughs> so, I no, hope... well, don't keep hanging it out. Get on with it, for goodness sake. <laughs> Get on with it. I hope you've all taken that to heart as oh. Barry Took begins the next round. Barry, the subject is staying up all night, 60 seconds, starting now. I like staying up all night to read letters like the one I have in my hand. It comes from Japan, and I will read it to you in its entirety. It says, Dear Sir, I am reading with an English teacher the Boner Book of Julian and Sandley, mainly for the purposes of picking up slangs and very colloquial expressions. The book was, as you know, highly praised in the... Uh, Tim Brooke Tyler has challenged. Tim Brooke... <laughs> Prior, if you want. <laughs> there was hesitation. I want to hear the rest of it, so can I have a point and let him go on, please? <laughs> no, you can't. You'll take over the subject. 30, um, um, uh, 29 seconds. 29 seconds, yes. I, I have to read backwards. They can't afford a watch that goes backwards. Yeah, I have to subtract. I can't afford time. a chairman either. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> Well, that uh, goes without saying. So, Tim, <laughs> you have the subject, uh, staying up all night, 39 seconds, starting now. Uh. uh Barry <laughs> has come back. Barry, what was your challenge? Disgusting hesitation there, I thought. No. But of a gentlemanly kind. Yes, of a... Uh, Barry, you have the subject back, and uh, our 37 seconds, staying up all night, starting now. Well, I enjoy staying up all night, reading letters like this one from Ichigoro Uchida, who comes from Tokyo, who says... The Boner Book of Julian and Sandy was, as uh, you know... Tim Brooke Taylor challenge. Uh, repetition. Yes, he's repeated all that in the last time. Yes. I'm just re-establishing it, Tim. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't re-establish without repeating yourself unless you use different words. I'm sorry, Barry Took. <laughs> so there are 28 seconds for Tim Brooke Taylor to take over staying up all night, starting now. Uh. <laughs> Barry Took has challenged. Thank you very much, Tim. Right, Hesitation. Barry Took, you have the subject, and Barry Took, you have 27 seconds. But on the subject of staying up all night, Barry Took, you begin now. I stay up all night reading, My English teacher is well trained in the job and quite able in every way as a language teacher, yet he still has some difficulty handling the queer and funny languages <laughs> brimming over the pages. I should be more than happy if you would kindly answer the following questions and let me know what they mean in plainer language. One, naff is it, page 25. Two, he's got the polari off, hasn't he? Three, but did you manage to drag yourself up on deck, page 27. I am sorry, but I can't see what Mr. Horn meant. Sincerely yours, Ichigoro Uchida, Tokyo. If you ever get a Japanese is, repeat, that is the most. That is a genuine letter from Japan, you know. That I is know. genuine. That is genuine. And what he's talking about, drag yourself up, you know, that was about, that was about Jude and Sam when they fell in the water. Right. They said, we were swept overboard, Mr. Orn, swept overboard, Mr. Orn. And he said, did you manage to drag yourself up on deck? And they said, now we're all casuals. <laughs> that was it. That was what it All I can say. Yes. Did you manage to drag yourself up on deck? It was, without the most devious repetition no, said, no, we way didn't drag of keeping up. going in casuals. just a minute. Oh, that was so funny. Oh, seriously? Yeah. I've just said it was uh, still, however interesting, the most devious and repetitious way of keeping going in just a minute. But you all want him to do it, and so Barry uh, Took, at the end of that round, is in second place with Peter Jones, one behind our leader, Tim Brooke Taylor. And the next person to begin is Tim Brooke Taylor. The subject, a piece of cake. Will you tell us something about that in the game, Tim, starting now? Billy Bunter is my favourite fictional character. He would say things like, I never touched your cake in any way, I only touched one piece. 
He would also... Uh, uh, Peter Jones has chance. A repetition of touched. Right, Very Peter. Reasonable. There are 51 seconds. A piece of cake starting now. What can be more nourishing and pleasant and comforting than a slice of fruit cake full of sultanas and raisins, almonds and currants <laughs> made with real eggs, a little wholemeal flour, real butter... <laughs> And real, uh, Barry, uh, a repetition of the word real. Yes, well done, Barry, too. Gosh, you I'm have hungry now, 35 seconds really on a hungry. piece of cake starting now. I would like to tell the world that today celebrates the 100th birthday of Mr. Ujaji Obovo, who invented the triangular crumpet. Uh, Peter Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew that. I never knew uh, that. Peter Jones. Oh, yes. I don't think Mr. Ujaji will bow bow knew it either. Um, <laughs> Peter, what was your challenge? Repetition of bow. <laughs> <laughs> a bonus point for a good challenge to Peter Jones. We leave the subject with Barry Took uh, as he keeps going on his flights of fantasy in A Piece of Cake starting now. A piece of cake, it, indeed it was for this humble man who from little more than a, a tiny shack in the middle uh, of nowhere, Tim Brooke Taylor has jumped. Yes, I agree, Tim. There are 18 seconds left starting now. I want the piece with the smarty on top was my <coughs> perennial cry. I never got it. I always got the one that never had it. Now, those of you <laughs> who are wondering what I'm talking about, I will tell you, this was a birthday in 19... Uh, Barry Tooker's challenge. You hesitated on the year, Tim. Yes, I'm afraid you did, Tim. Four seconds for <laughs> Barry Tooker's challenge. <laughs> Take the game with a piece of cake starting now. The piece of cake to which I was referring earlier was a wonderful evocation of the culinary art. Well, a riotous and hilarious contest. No? All right. <laughs> the, the, the end of the show, Kenneth Williams giving his usual good value. Alas, only finished in fourth place. Uh, it was very even between the other three. Tim Brooke Taylor and Peter Jones were equal and were uh, better to be, and they were two points behind this week's winner, who, before I announce his name, may I say that I've just had a, a telephone message from Barry Crow to say, will you please congratulate Barry Took on being a worthy winner? We hope you've enjoyed the game, the contest, the fun, the frivolity, and everything else that goes together to make up just a minute. And want to tune in again, same time next week when we take to the air and we play this incredible game. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. Present Kenneth Williams, Derek Nimmo, Clement Freud, and John Junkin in just a minute. And as the minute rolls fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've heard, we welcome John Junkin back uh, as our guest this week to pit his wits against our three regular players of the game. And once again, they will try and talk, if they can, on the subject that I will give them, and they will try and do it without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. Uh, we'll begin the show this week with Kenneth Williams. And as I've said before, who better? Kenneth, the subject is getting a shock. And there are 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. I had the most appalling shock when I endeavoured to remove from a wall the first flat I ever had, as a matter of fact, going back a few years now, I electric fire. Well, you see, my hands touch these wires. Little did I know you're supposed to have rubber gloves or something and a special screwdriver, because you've got to be earthed. I wasn't earthed. <laughs> 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 Repetition of earth. Yes, you were not earthed indeed. And so, um, Clement, you uh, have a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject, which is getting a shock, and there are 34 seconds starting now. I think the most significant shock I've ever had was when the Speaker of the House of Commons approached me and said, you have not got a dukedom in the New Year's Honours <laughs> list. I was astonished. It was something which I had had reason to believe. I said had had, but I say had had again. Um, has being so honest. Self-confessed repeater. I know. Isn't he honest? So, Derek, you take over the subject and a point for that, of course. Sixteen seconds are left. Getting a shock starting now. Some few years ago, I was in Johannesburg, and a party of recruits had been brought in to work in the gold mines. And they had come from the more distant areas of Africa. And they were trying to explain to them the difficulties... Uh, John Junkin challenged. Hesitation. Yes, I would agree, John. So, five seconds to go, starting now. Getting a shock entails some such thing as a bucket of water being thrown over one unexpectedly. Um. The whistle went as the buzzer went, but the whistle wins out, and this week it is blown once again by Sandra Pronger, who is deputising for Ian Messeter, who can't be with us. It also tells us that 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at that moment has an extra point. It was our guest, John Junkin. So at the end of that round, he's equal in the lead with Derek Nimmo. And, Derek, will you take the next round? The subject, interesting parties. Will you tell us something about those in the game starting now? I was once asked to the most interesting party by Sandra Pronger. It was held above a little shop in Soho, and you had to press a button labelled 33. She took me upstairs and asked me to meet her friends, one of whom was the local vicar. And I was so intrigued with this dear, sweet lady who I'd seen nestling in the arms of David Hatch, our producer for so many years. Not only had ecclesiastical connections, but also access to the aforementioned room so high above one of the more disreputable areas of the great city in which I live. But she was quite at home there. And what was so fascinating to me was she opened the door at the far corner of the room and led me along a uh, red... Clement Freud is charged. Repetition of room. Yes, I'm afraid so. I wanted to hear more about that. <laughs> <laughs> and so did Sandra Pronger, too. <laughs> fiction, fiction all the way. There are five seconds uh, with you, Clement, on the subject of interesting parties, starting now. Women who are easily the best other sex I know are pretty important when it comes... <laughs> So at the end of that round, Clement Freud got the extra point for speaking as the whistle went, and he's now in the lead. And Clement, will you begin the next round, the subject, dealing? Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? Dealing needs a pack of cards, ideally, if you want to satisfy the punters. And if you deal twice, it's called double dealing, which is quite different and also illegal. Ace, King, Queen, Jack, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Hearts, spades, clubs, diamonds are just some of the words that you would hear at a party in which playing cards are on show. Uh, John Junkin has done Repetition of playing cards. No, cards before. Playing hyphen cards, second time. <laughs> oh, it is well, not going to wriggle out of it like that. In English language. Yes. No, no, John, you're right. You, you have uh, a correct challenge there. And uh, anyway, you got well away from dealing. You were talking about cards, though I know there's a connection. John, you have 32 seconds on dealing, starting now. 
Dealing also means purveying. One can be a dealer in wood or in groceries or fruit or meat. And Clement Freud has That's done That's four oars. Yes, I... Well. <laughs> Not a healthy thing in just a minute or any time. <laughs> uh, and so you take the subject back again with 23 seconds dealing starting now. On the stock market in the city of London, you will find a substantial number of dealers whose involvement in finance and speculation is expert, second to almost none except operatives on Wall Street, who also deal in commodities as well as stocks, shares and equities of a very wide or you may call it Catholic nature. British Petroleum... So Clement Froy then cleverly kept going till the whistle, gained an extra point, increased his lead, and John, your turn to begin the subject, bricklaying starting now. Starting whenever you like, bricklaying is a subject about which I know less than nothing. I have seen it demonstrated, and I can only describe the method used by the gentleman who I presume was called a bricklayer. He took a brick in his hand and placed it with great care upon a bed of wet cement. He then took another, which he placed beside the first one, added some more of this strange lubricious mixture, which he tapped into place with a trowel, and then, taking a spirit level, he placed them across these two... Uh, don't give him a charge. No, placed. Yes, you were placing. You had to if you were going to build this ruddy wall. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know anything about it, you're a bit desperate. I know. I think you started off something which eventually you had to trip yourself up on, John. But uh, you kept going for good time and uh, 35 seconds, in fact. So there are uh, 25 left for you, Derek, on bricklaying, starting now. I must confess that, like John Duncan, I am to the world of bricklaying what Dan and Rue is to sheet metal welding. <laughs> but I have lots of times observed people bricklaying with great fascination, was tremendously encouraged to know and to learn, indeed, many years ago, that Winston Churchill was a most devoted bricklayer. Round about Chartwell, he put one brick upon another and constructed walls of amazing beauty. So at the end of that round, Derek Nimmo moved forward, but he's still in second place. John Junk in third, Kenneth in fourth, and Kenneth, your turn to begin. The subject, a rhinoceros. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? Well, this is a packet of melodical, the idea of this sort of quadruped, which is horned in the nose with the thick layers of the skin that hangs all over the body, rather like certain people I've seen who <laughs> got on in years and it's all there in pleats, so to speak, looking rather sad. Those creatures, when you see them in Africa, and of course we must remember that some of them are in the South Asia area as well, are a most delightful sight because to a certain extent there are zoologists who will tell you they are in danger of becoming extinct. And like the other pachyderm, the elephant, they won't be seen in the sort of profusion we've been used to in days of yore. What a shame that those little eyes, almost pig-like, as they gaze at you, and especially when they charge you. Oh, a well-deserved round of applause. First time for a while someone started with a subject and finished with it. It was the indomitable Kenneth Williams with Rhinoceros. So, Kenneth, a point for uh, speaking as the whistle went, a point for not being interrupted. And you're still in fourth place, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> we did enjoy it. Uh, Derek Nimmer, your turn to begin. The subject is bats, Derek. There are 60 seconds, starting now. When the Maoris followed the cuckoo to the land of the long white cloud, the only mammals extant upon that island of New Zealand were two marsupial bats, which, of course, you know, means that the babies will drop on the ground and crawl up the legs into the little pouch that is there for providing they used to fly away with these bats across the two islands of the country that I was telling you about. But recently, when I was in Bangkok, I went to the most interesting restaurant where the speciality of the house was 
a whole cage of bats. And they hung upside down, and he went along, as though you were choosing trout, and said, I would like that one. They spread them out by the wing, they slit their throat, and they caught all the blood in a little glass, and you drank it. <laughs> Clement Freud challenged. Repetition a little. I know. It was horrid, too, wasn't it? <laughs> so, um, you're right, uh, Clement, and there are 13 seconds on bats with you starting now. I think it's only correct to say that none of my best friends are bats. <laughs> All the people I know are extraordinarily intelligent, some even wise. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Rubbish, you know, Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you clapping? No. <laughs> you rotten audience. Will you take their names at the back and see they don't get in again? Right. Kenneth, <laughs> no you worry. have the subject, I am bats, and there are two seconds on the subject starting now. They're made of willow and they're used on the English cricket pitch. So, Kenneth Williams, speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point, and he's now in second place, alongside Derek Nimmo. <laughs> and uh, Clement Freud's in the lead, and it's his turn to begin, and the subject is making exotic bread starting now. If you want any flotsam, I've got some. If you want any jetsam, I can get some. Uh, John Junkin has challenged. Deviation. What's that got to do with exotic bread? Well, or flotsam and jetsam are, are things that are either thrown or float off ships. I don't see much exotic bread floating about. Well, probably, future. knowing Clement Freud, he was going to find some way of making exotic bread out of them. I know that's the way his mind works. But he actually hadn't established it, and he had been going for six seconds. So we'll oh. give you the subject, John, and there are 54 <laughs> seconds left, starting now. Making exotic bread is something about which Clement Freud is far more qualified to speak than I am. However, if I were given the task of making exotic bread, I think the first thing I would do would be to gather before me my ingredients. I would possibly use sunflower oil, the wool from virgin sheep, uh, droppings... Uh, Derek Nemo challenge. Before droppings. Thank you, Derek. Yes. <laughs> well, after the virgin sheep, I'm not surprised. <laughs> there are 33 seconds for you, Derek, on making exotic bread starting now. I suppose it really depends where you're eating the bread, whether it is actually exotic. And Clement Freud has challenged. Yes, Clement. Hesitation. Uh, hesitation. Hesitation. The hesitation. The subject's back with you with 30 seconds on making exotic bread starting now. A flour, yeast, salt, sugar butter and water are clearly things that you would not put into exotic bread because they would be ordinary and are ingredients... Uh, Derek Nimmo, Charlie. Yes, I think so, yes. Derek. 20 yeah, seconds. So, 19 and a half, actually. Making exotic bread starting now. If, for instance, you got a sliced loaf in cashmere, that would be extremely exotic. On the other hand, if you found yourself devouring... Uh, Kenneth Williams... I've had a sliced loaf in cashmere and it wasn't at all exotic. <laughs> Just tasted like a bit of bread, that's all. <laughs> What's he on about? Exotic in cashmere. A <laughs> load of rubbish. I agree with you, Ken. I don't, I don't think sliced bread's exotic no, anywhere. No, quite right. Well, I knew he wouldn't put a word over your eyes. I knew he wouldn't get to you. Don't worry yourself, dear. <laughs> oh, yes. Right, I'm bright again, am I? Right, you've been in those climbs yourself, haven't you? <laughs> Whenever I agree with him, I'm very intelligent, and if I don't, I'm bats. Right, right. Uh, Kenneth, you have the subject. There are 13 seconds on making exotic bread starting now. You do it with those delightful things and curiously aromatic called sesame seeds. And they contain the most potent ingredient you can imagine because they're absolutely... <laughs> So, Kenneth, speaking as the whistle went, gained another point. So overcome with excitement, he squeezed Clement Freud for the <laughs> listeners who wondered why our audience was laughing. And he's in second place alongside Derek Nimmer. They're only three points behind our leader, Clement Freud. John Junkin is trailing, only two behind our second place, and he begins the next round. The subject, John, is mixing a drink. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? I think the favourite drink that I have ever mixed is a Bloody Mary, if I am permitted to say that on the BBC on Radio 4. The ingredients contained therein are tomato juice, vodka, celery salt, Tabasco sauce, ice 
and a small prayer which was taught to me by a Tibetan Lama whose life I saved in the Himalayas. <laughs> the method of mixing the drink is as follows. A glass is placed before one, and into it are put the ingredients that I have already... Uh, Clement Freud, Charles. Repetition of ingredients. You did say ingredients <coughs> before, I'm afraid, John. So, Clement picked you up, and he has another point, and there are 27 seconds mixing a drink, Clement, starting now. I've always been very interested in mixing drinks which are aphrodisiac because oysters don't work, and semolina pudding, quite clearly, is food <laughs> rather than liquid. So pineapple juice and aromatic herbs mixed with hock and moselle, crushed ice... Uh, Derek Nimmo, Charlie. Yes, I think so, Derek. So you have nine seconds of mixing a drink, starting now. I think one of the great art forms of the world is to watch a New York barman mix a Manhattan or a sidecar. He talks to it while he is mixing the drink, Pouring the ingredients into the shaker, tosses around, and... <laughs> so the situation is exactly the same at the end of that round. They've all got more points, and Kenneth begins the next round. Kenneth, the subject is déjà vu. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? I will recall a review being staged with this title at a theatre not so far from here with an old favourite Sheila Hancock in it and young George Cole. A delightful pair they made and the title, of course, an affectionate view at the past through rose-tinted, shall we say, spectacles, so that we recreate a delicious memento of the pastish... Uh, I mean, not the past... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say pastish. I know. I meant pastish. I know. That's what I meant, you see. Didn't matter what you said, that, <laughs> that school over there would have had you as their mascot any time. <laughs> Uh, Kenneth, you kept going for 35 seconds. Well done. Bad luck. John Junk in the correct challenge. 25 for you on Deja Vu starting now. It's French, I understand. I don't speak the language myself, but I believe it means it has been seen before and is experienced occasionally by people interested in... Uh, Derek Nimmo Repetition challenge. of people. Yes, yes, and it's Derek Nimmo with the subject and 13 seconds Deja Vu starting now. I once went to a house in Northamptonshire to which my... To my knowledge, I'd never been before, and I had this extraordinary feeling of deja vu. Uh, Clement Freud. Repetition of my. Well, it's a bit nitpicking, but um, all right, there we are. <laughs> you did say my, and I've got to be fair and say right. it's correct, and so you take the subject, Clement, and seven and a half seconds deja vu starting now. This is a French term meaning already seen, and I'm glad that people listen with care because John Junkin had a quite... Uh, John Junkin challenged. Hesitation. John Junkin... He didn't really hesitate. I'd like to agree with you, John, because he's trying to get well, at you. Well, agree with me. Go on. I know. Live it's all a bit ridiculous, isn't it? So, Clement, you continue with half a second on Deja Vu starting now. <laughs> and, <laughs> John Junkin, you got in that time on hesitation. Well done. So, you have half a second on Deja Vu starting now. Deja Vu. As though you see how sporting they can be when they're under pressure. And uh, it's very even. Kenneth Williams, one point behind John Junkin. John, two points behind Derek Nimmo. And he's two behind our leader, Clement Freud. Derek, your turn to begin. The subject, microchips. Will you tell us something about those in the game starting now? Sorry. You, you, hesitation. Yes. Hesitation. Hesitation. I, Definite hesitation. I could see I, it. I, I could feel that. that. You know, you could right. see it, couldn't I, you? It's my turn, was it? I'm so sorry. Yes, it's your turn to begin. Oh, well, no, no, it's not his turn. I've got it. I've got That's him on hesitation. <laughs> Let me just establish something. Excuse me. Is your name Derek Nimmo? <laughs> sorry? Uh, is your name Derek Nimmo? Yes, I'm afraid to admit And is that your usual voice? <laughs> <laughs> And have you played the game before? And yes, is that yes, your own hair or is it a wig? <laughs> <laughs> if you can answer yes to all those questions, <laughs> Kenneth Williams has a correct challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kenneth, you take over microchips with 59 seconds starting now. These are chips you eat at the microphone and people <laughs> do not welcome your doing so. In fact... One of the chief sound engineers in this very building today said to me, all this fat and rubbish that they're throwing into the microphone because they're eating their chips around it. <laughs> 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 Repetition of microphone. Yes, I'm afraid you said the microphone before. 
Kenneth. So Clement has a correct challenge, and the subject is microchips, and there are 44 seconds starting now. This is very much the industry of the future, and I wish this government would realise that while there's £4,000 million of North Sea oil revenue, all of which is being used to finance unemployment, it is the microchip business which should be the recipient of such bountiful finance. There are machines and all sorts of domestic appliance which needs no more than a microchip to free a woman from housework and get out... Uh, Kenneth Williams has chance. Seriously, we have now gone on to a great political diatribe about the status of the woman in the home. I mean, the way microchips nothing to do with that. Mm. I mean, we're into some great political... Di- he's trying to... Start. Propaganda is what he's indulging in. <laughs> I mean, he's not enlightening us at all. I was being enlightening about chips round the microphone, which I thought was quite nice, you know. I thought mm. it had a nice touch of <laughs> domesticity almost, you see. But Can I it? don't think he is. He's devious. It's nothing to do with microchips. I think what you said is actually devious. Yes. The position of the woman in the home. It's exactly where she should be. I mean, (laughs) ridiculous. Kenneth, you made your point, and it was completely incorrect, but we love hearing all about it. So Kenneth continues with 13 seconds on microchips starting now. There are some very interesting children's games which, with the help of microchips, allow infants, juveniles, and all people under the age of 14 to have enormous fun by pressing buttons, being given a question, quite often getting an answer which may even be correct. (laughs) So Clement, with the subject of microchips, kept going to the whistle went and gained the extra point, has increased his lead and... uh, He's just ahead of Derek Nimmo and Kenneth Williams and John Junkin are equal in third place and we start the last round with Clement Roy beginning and the subject, what the well-dressed man wears in bed. (laughs) Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? The well-dressed man wears nothing in bed. (laughs) Uh, Kenneth Williams has chance. That's ridiculous. How can he be dressed if he's got nothing on? I mean, it so says that dressed, doesn't deviation. it? On the card, it says dressed. That's right. Well, how can he be dressed? All right, dressed don't go on, If Kenneth. he's got nothing on. I agree with your very good challenge. So you well, take that's a silly challenge to agree Don't with. say that my challenge is a silly. <laughs> how dare you? I've come all the way from Great Portland Street to be in this game. No, I'm not going to be insulted. I agree with Kenneth. It's the well dressed man. You talked about the well undressed man. No, no, no. You talked about a naked man. But when a well-dressed man goes to bed, it's surely up to him whether he wishes to be well-dressed in bed or naked in bed. Ah, the subject is the well-dressed. What the well-dressed man wears in bed, and you say, "Wears, you great we- fool, wears, <laughs> and you can't wear nothing." What a oh, it makes you so angry, doesn't it? Oh, I'm out of my temper. You know, I get so my nerves get so frayed on this. <laughs> you so made nothing point, is a perfectly adequate answer. Yes, it was, and Kenneth's made his point, and he takes the subject with 56 seconds on what the well-dressed man wears in bed, starting now. I'm glad I had the opportunity to address you on this subject, because believe me, I know a bit about it. And you can't beat your shot silk or your poplin, not to mention the South the aisle cotton. That is delicioza against the flesh and really brings you on. I have had some of the most beautiful dreams lying there with my feather down pillow, of course, adjacent, and these garments have given me profound pleasure, not to mention the sensuous nature of actually caressing both the material and the Uh, surroundings. John Junkin has had the temerity to challenge. (laughs) John, this is unsuitable for children and people of a nervous disposition. (laughs) Half our audience are on the floor already. (laughs) And some of them are not together. The, um... So what is your other challenge? Uh... I haven't got one. I'm just frightened to death. Yeah, uh, deviation from... Uh, I suppose from the, so, from the, yeah. Yes, he was talking about his sensuousness rather than yeah, the, the well-dressed man, yes. And who said you were the well-dressed man, anyway? <laughs> it was a great shame because in the army I was forced to revert to this terrible flannel nightshirt. So I hate it. Oh, my God, you itch. You know, that awful itch feeling. And rough blankets instead of lovely sheets, of course. You see, there yeah. in the battle room, we didn't have had lovely yeah, sheets at all. We'd all love to hear from you further on this subject, but I have to be fair well, with you. Well, they're the things I would have said 
said, had I been allowed to keep the subject which I should have been allowed to, of course, well, you after see. after we finish the game, as this is the last subject, we'll keep half the audience to stay and they can tell you oh, more thanks, about your right. sensuous experiences in bed. <laughs> so, uh, John Junkin, our guest, you take over the subject with the ten and a half seconds what the well-dressed man wears in bed starting now. The well-dressed man would normally, in bed, wear, made of pure silk, either a pair of hand-tailored pyjamas or else a nightgown with a crest bearing his initials. So, as I said a little while ago, this would be the last round. We've now reached the end of it. John Junkin got the point for speaking as the whistle went, and so to give you the final score, an interesting result. Kenneth Williams, Derek Nemo, and John Junkin, I guess, all finished in second place but they were five points behind this week's winner, Clement Freud. <laughs> well, we do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute, and our thanks again to Sandra Pronger, who stepped in to help by blowing the whistle and keeping the score, and we want you to tune in again next week, when once again we will take to the air and we will play just a minute. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. We present Kenneth Williams, Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo and Sheila Hancock in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And once again, we're delighted to welcome back Sheila Hancock to try and do battle with our three regular competitors of the game. And uh, once again, they're going to try and speak, if they can, on the subject that I will give them, and they will try and do it without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from that subject. Derek, would you start the show off with the subject of disreputable people? Would you tell us something about that in the game, starting now? Disreputable people. I suppose one of the most disreputable people that I've ever read about was Samuel Foote, who actually set out a great wit of the 18th century to taunt actors. Foote found a way of uh, writing... Peter Jones' challenge. A repetition of foot, or really? feet, as you should have yeah. said, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so, Peter, yeah, you foot, have a correct challenge, so you get a point for that, and you take over the subject of disreputable people, and there are 37 seconds left, mm. starting now. Well, I think they're very often much more entertaining than reputable people. I would much prefer to be on a long train journey with, say, Horatio Bottomley or even Dr. Crippin, I think, <laughs> to be in their company and to listen to what they have to say, try to reason with them, perhaps compare notes, would be an enjoyable experience and might even teach one to uh, live. Uh, Derek Nemo challenge. Hesitation. Alban, uh, yes, I'm sorry you were there, Peter. There are seven seconds for Derek Nemo to take back the subject of disreputable people starting now. Disreputable people. I take Peter's point, actually. Nicholas Parsons is an entirely reputable person. And that, of course, why any train journey with him... <laughs> Derek Nimmo took a long time to get round to bringing me into the subject. But, uh, Derek, you were speaking as the whistle went, so you get an extra point for doing so, and you naturally have the lead at the end of that round. Peter Jones, will you take the next round? The subject is keeping an even distribution of fruit in a cake. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a long and involved subject, and perhaps if you... Rep 
repeat it a couple of times, you've probably got about 30 <laughs> seconds worth there. Uh, anyway, there's 60 seconds to go starting now. Keeping an even distribution of fruit in a cake. Well, I certainly hope Clement Freud is listening to this because I happen to know the answer. You just put the fruit, that is, sultanas, raisins, cherries, bits of candied <laughs> peel. Uh, Derek, never a chance. What? Hesitation, right? No, I was doing it slowly because people might be writing it down. <laughs> because we liked your comeback, Peter, we're going to be generous and let you keep it. So, Peter, we'll continue with the subject. <laughs> 37 seconds on, sorry, 44 seconds on keeping an even distribution of fruit in a cake starting now. In a bowl and you add some flour, jumble it all up together and the, the, the uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible oh, to get a recipe to write down just all those hours, you see. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm afraid Derek has it that time. Derek, there are 37 seconds this time on keeping an even distribution of fruit in a cake starting now. To keep an even distribution of fruit in a cake. I would first of all take a bowl and then spread on it the sultanas and raisins and currants and all the things that one needs to make this delicious cake. And then over the top I would put flour and roll it with a mill of some... Uh, can you Roll it with a, uh, a mill. Yes, yes, uh, I, I think it was just there. Uh, I was debating in the lottery of my mind, you which I... You want to wake up. You want to get out of here. <laughs> Pull yourself together, for goodness sake. You could be a chairman. Gracious me, you want to listen. <laughs> I was listening and I recognised it, but I had to decide whether it was long enough to be a pause or not. Well, I can, I'm help, giving... you. I can help you about that. <laughs> <laughs> On this occasion, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and would you like you to take over the subject. And there are 22 seconds on keeping an even distribution of fruit in a cake starting you now. Keep an even distribution <laughs> of fruit in a cake. And I've seen this done by an army chef by putting a lot of all ingredients into the bowl and then stamping with your foot on the whole lot. Now, this is the uh, Peter Jones has challenged. No, very bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> We're not interested in very good advice, mate. All you can do is challenge for deviation or repetition or hesitation and you couldn't do it. You just wanted to get your oar in. Not you hoping to get a few points. <laughs> you just have a very nasty mess in the bowl and very juicy feet. <laughs> never seen my feet. He was suggesting, actually, that it was deviation because you would not get an even distribution on the way this chap was doing. I object strongly. <laughs> I object to the bad manners on this show. I'm a well Well, then shut up. <laughs> What I will do, to be perfectly fair, because I'm not going to judge whether your army chef putting his foot on this cake would create an even distribution or uneven distribution. So I'm going to let our wise and intelligent audience now and let them be the judge. So if you agree with Peter's challenge, you cheer for him, and that means it's an uneven distribution. And if you disagree, you boo uh, for Kenneth, and that means it was an even distribution. And you do it all together now. <laughs> It was even. No an even distribution. Kenneth, you keep the subject according to the audience and you have eight seconds to continue on keeping an even distribution of fruit and a cake starting now. First part, I would agree, it's done with a wooden spoon and very diligent stirring until the right consistency is obtained and then... <laughs> So, Kenneth Williams kept going till the whistle went, gained an extra point for doing so, and with the other points in the round, he is now in the lead. <laughs> Alongside <laughs> Eric Nimmo, just ahead of Peter Jones and Sheila Hancock, and it wasn't so very long ago in one of these recordings you were complaining that you never got into the lead. Well, it goes in spades, Nicholas, you mm. see. Don't you know you have a period when nothing seems to go for you? You understand my point? Yes. yes. <laughs> well, I've been going through a bad patch. It's lasted about 14 years. <laughs>
Uh, right, uh, Sheila, uh, the subject is charm, and it's your turn to begin. And will you tell us something about it in the game, starting now? Well, I think everybody has charm. There isn't a single human being in the world that you can't find some little bit of them that's attractive and charming. I mean, for instance, if you look at the panel, you've got Nick... It's nice, nice hair. <laughs> <laughs> I was stumped. I, I was know, stumped. stumped. She looked at me and couldn't think of anything to say. I am shattered. I went blank. I really did. I went blank. I'm not surprised. I don't like it. There's that effect on most people. <laughs> So Sheila Hancock went blank, and uh, Peter, you have yes. 45 seconds to take over the subject of charm, starting now. As J.B. Priestley has said, quoting J.M. Barry, charm has a sort of bloom on it. Uh, Peter, Derek Nimmo challenged. The repetition of J. I'm afraid so, J.B. Priestley and oh, J.M. Barry. <laughs> <laughs> that is just a letter. I mean, we're going to get down to that sort of thing. You might as well say you can't say uh, you can't say the, you can't say any blooming word. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was laughing at Kenneth's outburst, but actually, no, I think it's it, it's a very good challenge, J.B. Well, Priestley and J.M. Barry. <laughs> I'll throw a can of water over you. I'll throw one over you, too. Don't worry yourself. <laughs> I've never heard such rubbish Listen, in my life. Listen, he'll stop you winning if you don't shut Oh, up. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, there's a point at which you snap, isn't there? <laughs> Genius like me coming along to hear this sort of quibbling. <laughs> this is it not be... quibbling. I think it was a good challenge. Derek, I agree with your challenge. <laughs> and so you take over the subject with 37 seconds. Charm starting now. I have a charm which I'm very... Uh, Deviation is no charm whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to be one of those no, shows again. No, 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 no. He's all right. He's all right, really. He I'm said just it... wild about the last issue, that's all. Yeah. I don't really mean he's got no charm. Of course he has. I yes. mean, you can exercise... He's got as much charm as you, hasn't he? Hey? He's got as much charm as you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kenneth didn't mean it, but give him a point for a very good challenge, because the only... because the audience enjoyed it for no other reason. It was not good in the game. But he said a charm, didn't he? Yes. You said a charm, mm. yes. It's probably one of those things to keep rheumatism at bay. <laughs> <laughs> So, Derek, oh, you, yes. get a, you get a point for a wrong challenge. You keep the subject. It's charm, and there are 35 seconds starting now. And it's a lucky Cornish pixie, which I bought from a Mrs. Trothan, who lives near Penzance. And I take this charm with me, and it has had the most beneficial effect. Sometimes I rub my charm until it gleams like gold, although, of course, it's actually made of brass. And it, for me, produces extraordinary... Good fortune. And that is really what a charm should be. It comes from a very old Latin word, Carmen, which ends... Uh, 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 I've <laughs> Hesitation. Yes, once he tried to show off his classical education, he dried. So, Sheila, you have the subject of charm with eight seconds to go, starting now. Nicholas has got this ability to smooth uh, over... Derek Nemo challenge. I was uh, regretfully repetition of Nick. No, I said Nick last time, didn't I? Yes. 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 You see, yes, oh. he did. Never. Yeah. Yeah. I thought... Yeah. Anyway, we'll, we'll decide that you did, Sheila. <laughs> and you have five seconds on charm yeah. starting now. Pouring oil on troubled waters such as Kenneth and Derek and Peter when they get snotty. <laughs> Well, it's a very even contest because not a lot of points are being scored and they're keeping close. Sheila Hancock's now crept up into second place alongside Peter Jones and they're both only one point behind Derek Nemo and Kenneth Williams, our joint leaders. Kenneth, your turn to begin. The subject, Amber. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? I had a very pretty row of amber beads once and alas, they became irretrievably lost along with those lovely old hooks and eyes I used to save in a wonderful little thing made of japonica. And the amber in this japonica box... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, his japonica tripped him up. So, P uh, Peter, there are 39 seconds for you to talk on amber, starting now. Well, I think it's made of rosin, and it lasts for a long time. Occasionally you find a wasp or bee imprisoned in it, and it keeps them like that as it... Uh, Kenneth Williams, Deviation, there's no... It's not made of rosin, it's made of resinous. 
material. It's not rosin. Where'd you get this word <laughs> rosin? <laughs> Is that right? No. I thought it was called rosin. No, rosin's resin. something you use to uh, get a shine on things. Isn't that the same thing? No. <laughs> really? It's a resin, I think. Oh, it's well. Right. It's nice to have an educational element in the program. <laughs> Know that resin is it? Yeah, it's like they make the wine out of in Greece. Yes, don't go on. <laughs> I'm going to let the subject back. Retina, you're thinking of? Oh, is that it? Yes. <laughs> and that's what you put on your shoes. <laughs> you can, but you that might have the dogs licking them. The yes. Quality in the uh, in the timber. Yes. Yes. Right. So there are 27 seconds for you to take over the subject of Amber Kenneth, or take it back, I should say, starting now. Well, she was the subject of a great novel, you know, a story of this wanton woman who was always getting mixed up in various sexual escapades and held a rave readership in... No! Uh, Sheila Hancock... Are running out of breath or hesitation? Well, I couldn't hear a word he was saying, so I don't know what... <laughs> He kind of ran out. Well, I, I couldn't hear a word, so I'll have to say, Sheila, that, that yes, he ran out and there was a pause. So you now have the subject of amber with 14 seconds to go, starting now. I once had a beautiful amber ring, which was a kind of murky brown set in gold, about half an inch of Uh, Derek Nimmo, Deviation. Why? Well, if it was a murky brown, it wouldn't be amber and it wouldn't be beautiful. She was describing it, and her amber ring might have been exactly that colour. We do not know. She hasn't got it with us to prove the point. So she keeps going with six seconds on amber, starting now. No, very sadly, I lost it a little while ago, but it was amber. It was called some special sort of amber. <laughs> So Sheila's special sort of amber Smoky kept her going. Smoky. It was amber. I knew it all the time, Sheila. And you had an extra point for speaking as the whistle went, and you are now in the lead. <laughs> oh. Derek, your turn to begin. The subject is olives. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? Sitting there on the balcony, overlooking the Bray of Piraeus, I was eating some beautiful olives and quaffing retsina at the same time. <laughs> How nice, I thought. And as I did this, I remembered Peter Jones, that dear, wise old chum who was much given <laughs> to going to islands like the ones that I've described. Olives are uh, something which has been a symbol of purity and fecundity for many years. Indeed, ancient maidens used to weave olive leaves into uh, their hands. Can you a challenge? Well, a deviation, I mean. Ancient maidens? I mean, I'm not making a show. We do all these ancient old crones who are suddenly a maiden. Yes. I mean, it's ludicrous. Uh, yes, uh, you can't be ancient and a maiden. Oh, I shouldn't have thought so. <laughs> <laughs> You're a crone. I mean, if he means maidens in ancient times, well, he should pick his language more cleverly, should So, I? Kenneth, you take over the subject with 27 seconds on olives starting now. Whatever's olives, usually mine as well, because we know each other very well. <laughs> and she's often said to me, anything you fancy, dearie, just you make it known and I'll accommodate you. <laughs> always the one. And I have found her to be a stalwart in times of appalling adversity. I run to olives and she's always said, what's olives is your name. <laughs> she that hand got That's the second time she yes. said it. You, you repeated the whole phrase, what olives is your name. What olives is yours? Because she's such a generous <laughs> So, Sheila, you cleverly got in with one second ago. Oh, that's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about doing a I'm Freud. Doing a Freud, yeah. yeah. Doing a Freud. And she's sitting in Freud's chair there, and yeah, the. Um, it takes you over. Uh, yes. One second ago on Olive, Sheila, starting now. Olives are my very. <laughs> So, Sheila Hancock has increased her lead at the end of that round, and Peter Jones begins the next round. The subject, Peter, is why I've given up the harp. <laughs> <laughs> Will you tell us something about that subject in the game, starting now? Well, I haven't given up the harp, as a matter of fact, so I can't see how I can be asked to... In fact, I've never taken it up in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> and I've no intention of doing so while I'm still living. Yes, yes. What? 
what in the fact, and the fact that you in the fact that you never actually went on the subject. So uh, <laughs> Kenneth has a correct challenge with fifty. Terribly seconds. unfair. It's like, have you stopped beating your wife? You know, it's just uh, <laughs> one of those uh, questions, isn't it? Yes. Well, let's see what Kenneth does with it. I think that was the reason that came in must have thought of it. To see so that I'd lose it to him. Yes, I see what you mean. Yes. <laughs> Well, we thought Maybe. we might have a bit of fun with this one. Uh, Kenneth, the subject is why I've given up the heart. There are 52 seconds starting now. The reason was I was very privileged once to help out with the Morriston Orpheus Choir, and one of the instruments used there was a beautiful Welsh harp, and I was instructed uh, about playing it. Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Hesitation. Yes, I couldn't hear again. So, Peter, you have the subject back again. There are 37 seconds. Why? I've given up the harp starting now. Well, assuming that I did take up the harp, <laughs> let us imagine that I played it for a while and then gave it up. <laughs> See, that got hesitation. Yes, Sheila, that's no, no hesitation. You what was the hesitation? You, you paused. Stopped. You paused. Paused. Yes, yeah, paused. It was yes. a dramatic paused. pause, but I'm afraid right. we can't allow it. Yes, I got to the end of a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila, will you tell us something about why I've given up the harp 29 seconds starting now? Why I've given up the harp is because I think the Carpenter's Arms is a better pub. Because they served rotten beer at the harp. It was kind of smoky and it had a bad froth on the top. So eventually I toddled down the road and I went into the Carpenter's Arms and said, I don't and think Derek much Demo of the harp. Has his been in the Carpenter's Arms Yes, twice. the Carpenter's Arms oh, yes. has got too much of a plug in this show. They're rushing down there now. There are 15, 14 seconds, uh, Derek, on why I've given up the harp, starting now. Why I have given up the harp is because it's the cognizance of Ireland in heraldry, and there's something particularly distasteful about those three points of the harp that remind you of the Irish trilogy. Um, Peter Jones, a challenge. Oh, I don't know. Some, there must be some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like that part of it at all, you know. <laughs> I just think you've been rather sharp, but I'm afraid I have to be fair to Derek Nimmo and... I am a bit trigger-happy with his hand. You know? <laughs> you've tried very hard, Peter, but Derek keeps the subject. There is, there is one-fifth of a second to go, starting... Now. Why I've given up the heart. <laughs> An even more interesting situation really now. Important. Let me give you now the score. You have to be bored by all these scores. Yeah. Dreary, well, you be, might be surprised to hear that some people actually do enjoy knowing what the score is. And you are now in second place with Derek Nimmo. You are two points behind our leader, who's Sheila Hancock. And Peter Jones is two points behind you. And Sheila takes the next subject. And this one should give us some fun. If Sheila loses it, that is. The subject is dancing with Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> and you have 60 seconds to tell us something about that in the game, Sheila, starting now. I should imagine that if one was lucky enough to dance with Nicholas Parsons, it would be a kind of graceful waltz. I don't somehow think it would be reggae or anything like that. This Ginger Rogers dress I'll have on and he'll be in an evening suit or tails even and we'll waltz around. Uh, oh. Derek Nimmo has challenged. Oh, the second waltz. Yes. I'm afraid that was the second waltz. I yes. have to save the last waltz for you, Sheila. <laughs> thank but, you, uh, Nicholas, thank but you. The second one goes to Derek Nimmo. And <laughs> Derek... <laughs> you should not let him win it. Oh, I don't know. We can have some fun with this one. Derek Nimmo, you have the subject of dancing with Nicholas Parsons. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? I can imagine absolutely no fun at all in dancing with Nicholas Parsons. And the fact that I've got 27 seconds in which to talk about it is almost too long. The thought of those great hairy arms locked around now fills me with great disgust and revolt. Can you imagine any of you, ladies and gentlemen, I for you, the thought of that ogre, that monster my man, treading on your toes, his great hairy... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me too much hair, I'm sorry. Yeah. You are so, getting a bit thin. Uh, <laughs> Sheila, you have the subject back and there are 12 seconds on Dancing with Nicholas Parsons, starting now. The band should be something like Victor Sylvester and... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. It won't be in this world if it's Victor Sylvester. <laughs> It's a ref 
Accord. She did say it should be something like Victor Sylvester. She yes. didn't say it will be our dear departed Victor Sylvester. So, Peter, a lovely challenge. The audience gave you a round of applause, so give Peter a bonus point. But Sheila gets the subject, it, and there's uh, another point, because it was a very wrong challenge. Yeah, a there are eight seconds left. Dancing with Nicholas Parsons, Sheila. You like the subject, didn't you? Uh, Peter's challenge. Hesitation. Yeah. <laughs> He wants to talk yes, about it. Give it to him. Sheila gets a point for that incorrect challenge. Uh, Peter Jones takes over the subject because he wants to talk about dancing with Nicholas Parsons starting now. Well, naturally, I would prefer to be a wallflower. But <laughs> if I were forced and paid an enormous amount of money, I suppose I would consent. <laughs> So Sheila's generosity has brought Peter up into a second place alongside Derek Nimmo. Kenneth's one point behind, but Sheila has a very strong lead there. Kenneth, you begin the next round. The subject is stoppers. Can you tell us something about those <laughs> in the game, starting now? They're peculiarly difficult for me because they should contain right inside the cap, if you're using the screw type, a sort of material which acts as a washer, if you like, but to ensure that when shaken up and down, it doesn't actually dribble in any way. Now, that particular element seems to be often missing in my bottles, and consequently, obeying the injunction, which is always there from the chemist, shake before using. Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Two shakes. No, I said shaking before you, great fool. <laughs> <laughs> It's so ridiculous, isn't it? I know why I come here. I go all the way from Great Poland Street. <laughs> I mean, just because he made a mistake, you don't well, need to Well, you've got no right to. I don't make any ever on this show. Oh. <laughs> For once, Kenneth, the audience unanimously disagreed with you. I have an all expelled from here. <laughs> So, actually, um, Derek was incorrect, so you keep the subject, and there are 29 seconds on stoppers starting now. Children have some that they chew called gob stoppers. <laughs> in my ear, um, Peter Jones, a challenge. No, they don't chew gob stoppers. <laughs> They're much too hard. No, you can't chew a gob stopper. That's a good challenge, yes. You have to suck it. And so, Peter, you have 24 <laughs> seconds <laughs> to tell us something about... <laughs> Stoppers starting now. Well, I have in mind show stoppers. People who come on in the middle of a review or a variety program and they actually stop the performance with enthusiasm engendered by the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Derek Nemo came in. Yes. audience and hesitation. Yes, Derek, oh, well, you well, have yes. ten seconds on stoppers starting now. Yes, and the sort of joke that you hear is, what have you got if you've got a green ball in your left hand and one in your right one as well? And the answer is, of course, uh, a leper horn done divided the tin. repeating one again. <laughs> his old tricks. This time you've got in with one and a half seconds to go with a correct channel. Ah, great. Yes. Great, that's great, isn't it? The subject <laughs> yes. is stoppers and you start now. My dentist is always... <laughs> So, Peter Jones was speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point, and unfortunately we have come to the end of the show this week. The final score was that Kenneth, who had the lead at one point, finished up in a very strong fourth place, only one point <laughs> behind the two who were equal in second place, and that was Peter Jones with Derek Nimmo, and our winner was our guest, who only will come <clears throat> once in a while, but when she does come, she adds not any charm, wit, and inventiveness to the game, I wish you'd come more often. It was Sheila Hancock. <laughs> so congratulations, because it's difficult with the regulars to try and beat them, and Sheila, our guest, she did just that. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the show this week. We'll want to tune in again. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch.
present Kenneth Williams, Peter Jones, Clement Freud and Derek Nimmo in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Hello and uh, welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard, we have our four regular players of the game this week. And they're going to try and talk at different times, we hope at different times, on the subject that I will give them. And they will try and do it without hesitation, repetition or deviating from the subject. We'll begin the show with Derek Nimmo. Uh, Derek, the subject is poor. So can you tell us something on that subject in 60 seconds starting now? To be poor is something I know a great deal about. To be as poor as a church mouse. This particular quadruped, if it is found in an ecclesiastical building, would be especially poor because there is very little food to be found in any kind of denomination. And Peter Jones a challenge. Hesitation. Yes, I, I think so, yes. He got onto the Ecclesiastes and uh, he hesitated. So, Peter, you um, get a, a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject, which is poor. There are 42 seconds left, starting now. Well, our cat, whom regular listeners to this program will know is called Primrose, has four <laughs> paws in all. And the one paw that I'm choosing to talk about this evening is the white one. She has three others, which are black. But the one on the right-hand side at the front... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. No, it's not right. The one is chosen about to talk about the right one. The one on That's the right, right. on the right-hand side. No, white side. one was the first time. The white time. one, he yeah. said, the first time. Oh. White. I ought to be on your other side, Derek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one with the good ear. For those who, who are um, at home listening, I explain that Derek Nimmo and uh, Peter Jones are sitting together on my left, and uh, Clement Freud and Kenneth Williams are on my right, and so that is the reason for the deafness to which you refer. What are you talking about? Uh, there are 24 <laughs> seconds left for uh, Peter Jones to continue on the subject of paw, starting now. And it's attached to the feline's leg by <sighs> gristle. Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Repetition of leg. I haven't mentioned their legs before. He hasn't mentioned their legs. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. I think there's sorry, something sir. wrong with your head. <laughs> You're so trying too hard, sir. Peter's got another point for a wrong challenge. There are 19 seconds on paw with you, Peter, starting now. She can wash with it and lap up milk. And no doubt, if one was able to open the tin of cat food, she would be able to put the uh, paw... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Revolution of cat. Uh, you know about this cat. We've cat heard about food, cats. Yes. He cat said food. cat food, which was not... It is hyphenated. It's not, um, mm -hmm. not repeating the word cat. So, um, <laughs> ten seconds are left. Peter on paw, starting now. She can lick it with this long pink tongue, which she keeps perfectly clean in spite of the fact that she's often messing about in the garden with the paw. Well, a, a unique situation at the end of that round, because it's never happened before in just a minute. There's only one person who's got any points, and he happens to have quite a lot. Peter Jones took the subject, kept it in spite of uh, the challenges, and so at the end of that round, he has five points, and Derek Nemo, Clement Foyne, and Kenneth Williams haven't got any. But, Kenneth, we're going to hear from you now. And the subject is temperament. So can you tell us something about that in the game, starting now? This is the characteristic which distinguishes a person's behavior. We may talk of a bovine temperament, we may talk of a lachrymose temperament. And, of course, you could be referring to somebody bucolically inclined in the same fashion. In fact, a piano tuner can arrange for a, an equal temperament to be given to your instrument, and that will be so... Uh, Derek Nimmo, uh, just... Hesitation. I think now, so. Now, I was just thinking of a word. I wasn't hesitating. <laughs> no. Because when the piano tuner does it, he arranges the 12 semitones all come at equal intervals, you see, yeah. if it's an equal temperament piano. Do you understand what I mean? Yes, yeah, I but, but... And that's very important for the listeners to know, because they all might take up the piano, and that would be very, very useful information to them. Mm. Yes, it and would. And therefore, you should never challenge <coughs> when you're getting in the way of information which they really desperately need to know. That lady was leaning forward there, eager, avid, to, to hear <laughs> what I was going to say. And I think, therefore, that one of the rules should be that any challenge which interrupts mm. something as enlightening and as marvellous Mm. informative as that mm. should be disallowed. Yes, but uh, I'm afraid within the rules as they exist... Don't uh, keep blethering on like that. It's <laughs> yes, I think it's Blether. one of my blethering days. I'm sorry, sir, for people well, who are at the border. 
What do you mean, get on with it? We were waiting for you to finish. Well, I, I should get going. We can't stop you. There are 20, uh, 31 seconds left, and uh, Derek's got the subject of temperament starting now. You have a very special temperament, I think, to play in just a minute. It is a game which is quite... Uh, Clement Freud has challenged. Hesitation. Yes, it is a game, indeed. 26 seconds on temperament with you, Clement, starting now. The ideal temperament for Macbeth would be that exhibited by the chairman rather than Peter Toole. Because he is able to put up with adverse criticism to an almost unparalleled degree. Not only can one boo, hiss, jeer, and shout obscene words ending in syllables which I would sooner not repeat on a program which could have the whole family listening. <laughs> For those who may never have heard just a minute before, when the whistle is blown by Ian Messiter, tells us that 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at that moment, of course, gets an extra point. At this round, it was Clement Freud, and he's now in second place behind Peter Jones. And Peter, your turn to begin. And the subject is, what makes me blow my top? I don't know why the audience reacted to that. I've never heard you actually blow it, Peter. But you have 60 seconds to tell us something on the subject starting now. Well, quite a number of things, of course. One is when people refuse to accept responsibility. You go into a shop and you say, this shoe has fallen apart on the first wearing, and the man says, it's nothing to do with me, I didn't make it. Things like that happen. And I do get rather annoyed because I feel, as a representative of the company... Uh, uh, Derek Nimmo, Charles. Yes, Derek. So you have 40 seconds now to tell us uh, something on what makes me blow my top starting now. I am a member of the Keep Britain Tidy campaign. And what makes me blow my top is when one drives along the road and sees people throwing rubbish into the street. <laughs> I think that's absolutely filthy, totally disgusting. Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. If you're driving along a road, you can't throw rubbish into the street. <laughs> See. See. Well, I, I, th I said seeing people, driving on red, seeing people. Well, people. you can't even see them unless you're having hallucinations. <laughs> <laughs> they could be throwing them out of the car in front. I think it is possible. And anyway, you couldn't use the word street twice because that would be repetition. So he did quite well there. So he keeps the subject. <laughs> and 28 seconds. What makes you blow my top, Derek, starting now? What makes me blow my top is also when you go into gardens and parks... Uh, Clement Freud, a Hesitation. Yes, I think so. Uh, Clement, <laughs> you have... Um, 23 seconds on what makes me blow my top starting now. What makes me blow my top is when the chairman gives challenges like hesitation, which are totally undeserved because the man spoke without <laughs> one moment. <laughs> you see? Hesitation. Hesitation, yes. Whatever made you guess that. What, what, uh, Derek, what, you have the subject back. 11 seconds. What makes me blow my top? Starting now. What makes me blow my top is hearing Nicholas Parsons come into the studio week after seven days talking absolute dribble and giving unjust decisions. That really makes me blow my top. <laughs> Derek Nimmo blowing his top in style on one of his favourite subjects there. Kept going to the whistle when gained the extra point. And he's now... No, he's only one point behind our leader, who is still Peter Jones. Clement, your turn to begin. The subject is beans. Can you tell us something about beans in the game, starting now? Beans is a subject which is difficult in just a minute because it's hard not to make it repeat. Although, clearly, it, it would hesitate... And if you were not very careful, just might deviate. Pulse is the common name for the bean family. And you have flageolet, haricot, white, green, canned, and the great American, which are those baked beans which you buy in tins which have made Mr. Heinz rich, famous, and a name to conjure with. For instance, if you get the aforementioned American philanthropist... Uh, Derek Nimmo has challenged. Yes, you mentioned about the American, in the, talking about American beans. Sorry, Clement. Mm. Uh, Derek, mm. you have 19 seconds to take over the subject of beans, starting now. In South America, they make birthday cakes out of beans which blow their own candles out. And they are very really faithfully useful, particularly at this particular festive time of the year. Uh, Clement Freud's challenge. Repetition of out. Out of beans, candles out. There were two outs, I'm afraid. Oh. Which seems a bit mean, oh, but it, it was accurate, so there we are. Oh. 
No, you're accurate, so I have to abide by the rules of the game. I have to be fair and just, especially when Derek Nimmo says that I, I'm not always. So there are seven and a half seconds on beans with you, Clement, starting now. Something which is known by exceedingly few people is that flatulence is induced not by the bean, but by the liquid encircling it. <laughs> so, um... Uh... Did you know that was true? Hmm? Hmm. If you wash your beans, you'll be all right. Oh, really? Eat lots. So, at the end of that uh, round, Clement Freud had the point for speaking as the whistle went. He's uh, still in third place, and Derek Nemo is equal with Peter Jones in the lead. Derek, your turn to begin. The subject, bands. Can you tell us something about that subject in the game, starting now? Quite early on in my career, I formed the very first rock and roll band in Great Britain. It was called Dave Shand and his aforementioned band. And why I did this, because there was a film with Bill Haley and his comets. It had just been released in Great Britain at that time. And I thought, what a wonderful idea it would be if the English public could listen to this new, thrilling musical band. And that is what I did. And I went to the Lyceum Theatre in Newport and started by telling the people... Uh, of uh, Peter Jones a challenge. Well, he's uh, two started and a number of other smaller words repeated. <laughs> Well, you don't need to rub it in, Peter. This one challenge is enough. And... Well, it often isn't with you. <laughs> I agree with the challenge, Peter. You take over the subject of bands, and there are 28 seconds left, starting now. Now, Harry Roy had a wonderful band, and so did Henry Hall. And they used to feature the uh, Clement Roy challenge. Henry Hall's wasn't that wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> But it's still not a deviation because uh, some people thought he was quite good. The subject is still bands. It's still with you, Peter. There are 22 seconds left, starting now. Lou Stone had one that used to play from the Kit Kat Club. And Maurice Winnick was another great leader in this era. But perhaps still, best of all, was the man who happily is still with us. Uh, Derek Nimmo, child. Tradition of still. Still with us, still leading his musician. Yes, what a miserable challenge, but it's <laughs> perfectly correct. <laughs> It's either repetition or it's not. Why should it be miserable if it's the word... Well, I always still. remark I did the same uh, thing to Clement Freud. Is absolutely right, because he's right. No, it's miserable because he's, he's, he's singling out... You see, the fact that you're picking on tiny little words, which, you, which are essential, really, in usage, ordinary usage, whereas repetition's about using a word which is singular in some fashion. He's been doing it, too. He drags everything down. <laughs> it's boring if you keep on nitpicking like that. I quite agree with you, Nicholas. I think you've got a very good point, sir. <laughs> What's come over him? Thank you very much, Kenneth. I, I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. And uh, Peter Jones uh, has... Oh, no, I'm sorry, Derek. It was a correct challenge, so you actually do have the subject. Four seconds on bands starting now. Ted Heath, Jack Parnell. There are some of the names that come to my mind. But... So, Derek Nimmo has taken the lead at the end of that round, and Kenneth Williams, your turn to begin. The subject, coincidence. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? Coincidence, strictly speaking, means that which occurs at the same time in another place and thus can be compared with what occurred formerly, you see. But other people use it in wide context. And I could say, for an example of coincidence, I, 25 years ago, was in a production at the Lyric Hammersmith. Now the wheel turns full cycle and I'm there again all that time later doing another thing which equally successful. Of course, a lot of people say it's something to do with that's to do with the fact that you are a brilliant man. Well, that is true and I would not deny that. But, uh, Peter Jones. Well, I don't think it's a coincidence to be re-engaged 25 years later. <laughs> It's a very long time, and no doubt the wounds have healed by this time. <laughs> <laughs> and a new generation of theatre manager is probably in charge. It's not a coincidence. Well, in the, uh, in the broadest... <laughs> In the broadest sense of the term, it is a coincidence. Of course it but, is, Nicholas. But, Thank but, you, Nicholas. But I it think... Is, it is, because on both occasions, I did a flat that it happens when he's the West End of London. Yes. transferred. So that's a coincidence. Yes. And he well, didn't, he didn't happened... want to be so conceited to say it was the same play which he was... It wasn't no, the no. same play, you're grateful. One was Sandy Wilson, the other... 
I thought you were referring. I thought you were referring to Luther. What the musical about yes. the black comedy? I can hardly compare the two. Oh, well, it was no. a coincidence, in as much as he is playing at the same theatre twice, and that probably is the first time that's ever happened to him. I think what we do is Peter's challenge was so delightful we give him a bonus point for a good challenge, but we leave the subject with Kenneth and he continues, uh, um, and also a point for being interrupted, uh, with 13 seconds, sorry, 17 seconds left. Coincidence, Kenneth, starting now. An extraordinary thing occurred when I was staying in an hotel when a man had a row with a lady who was erecting an umbrella and he said, interfering with his sunshine, which he wanted to dab on all over his body, get a tag. And many years later, I'm the same man discussing uh, that very subject. Uh, doing Nimmo challenge. Repetition of man. Oh, it's a <laughs> footly. <laughs> There are two seconds to go, uh, Derek. Uh, you cleverly got in just before the whistle, and the subject is coincidence. It is the most now. tremendous coincidence. We should be sitting here tonight with only two seconds to go. <laughs> so, Derek Nemo once again was speaking as the whistle went and has increased his lead at the end of the round. Peter Jones is still in second place. Clement Freud in third, and Kenneth Williams trailing a little, but giving his usual good value because he doesn't care about points. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Jones, will you begin the next round? The subject is the Nick. Will you tell us something about that in the game? Starting now. Well, the original Nick is still in existence in Suffolk, on the south side of the river. And just beside it, I think, is a theatre, or the site for one, which Sam Wanamaker was going to perform in with a number of other people, putting on plays of the original period that the Nick was built in, I understand. It was a sort of prison where people were thrown, debtors and others, and it's dark, it's frequented only by American tourists and a few other people who were mildly interested historically in this site. And uh, <laughs> Kevin Freud's challenged. It's a reputation of sight. Yes, I think you were getting rather bored with the whole thing yourself, I weren't you? I was, I was getting bored and I knew you were. <laughs> and I could see the audience were. <laughs> Clement Freud, you have the subject. It's the Nick, and there are 24 seconds left, starting now. I met a man recently in prison, and I asked him why he was there, and he said that his first wife had died eating poison mushrooms. And I said, this didn't seem very serious. And he said, but his second wife had met her demise... Ah. Um, can you him? Twice, twice. There were two wives, yes. You will never oh, know. A paltry chance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not yes just a... but everyone's been so paltry, I've decided to get me own back. <laughs> I've sat here silent long enough. Oh, yes, you'd hardly ever speak. I know that, Kenneth. There are ten seconds on the nick with you, Kenneth, starting now. I did once visit the establishment, which is mentioned in the title, but I was not, I happy to say, in any criminal sense present there. <laughs> So, Kenneth Williams uh, was speaking as the whistle went, but uh, got the extra point, but I'm afraid he's still in fourth place. Clement Freud, your turn to begin. The subject is face-saving. Would you tell us something about that in the game, starting now? One of the best ways to save your face is to grow a beard, have hair all over it, and the skin will last you all your life because it's not exposed to the elements whether the wind comes from the west, north, south, or east, her suit growth over your face is exactly the protective thing that it needs. My thing is to go on a summer's evening. Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Repetition of things. Oh, that's what right. a small word. Oh, what, small. just... <laughs> how do, You wouldn't allow that, would Of you? course I would. Uh, uh, Peter, you have the subject, and there are 34 seconds on face saving, starting now. Well, I don't agree that a beard is a perfectly good uh, method. Uh, uh, Clement <laughs> Freud, a challenge. Uh, hesitation. I think I would agree, Clement. So you have 30 seconds to take back the subject of face saving, starting now. One of the very few things for which there's no society under royal patronage or that of anyone else is to save faces, not in this country or indeed elsewhere. You would have thought but a royal association. Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Repetition of royal. Yes, Derek. Fifteen seconds on face-saving with you, starting now. In the Orient, particularly in China, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and such countries where there is a large population who are terribly involved with saving face, because to lose face is something which one cannot do. So therefore, you must never shout or... <laughs> 
So, Derek Nimmo once again has increased his lead, and he also begins the next round, and the subject is a good service. There are 60 seconds as usual, starting now. I like a really nice old-fashioned matins. When you sit there in the church and the priest comes in and you hear the words that were first enshrined by King James when he commanded the prayer book to be written, one suddenly thinks this is what it ought to be about, a good service. Something that you recognize, words, phrases that are dear to one's heart. And I find this extraordinarily satisfying. Of course, other kinds of good service. The one you hope to find when you take your automobile into a motor car repair shop. And it's very seldom in my experience, I'm afraid I have to say this, that one these days gets a good service. So often, things are left undone, and things that should have been... <laughs> 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 Too many things. Too many things. Yeah. Oh, what a small fault I'd pick on. It was jolly good, wasn't it, dear? Yes. <laughs> very nice, yes. Going straight from church into the automobile. 18 seconds on a good service with you, Clement, starting now. You throw your ball high in the air and extending your right hand, which grips a racket, swing towards the net and your opponent on the far side of it. 15, love, says the referee, watched by the umpire. And the linemen, the ball boys, and the... Clement Freud got the point for speaking as the whistle went, creeping up on Peter Jones in second place, but they're both um, three or four points behind Derek Nimmo, our leader, and Kenneth Williams is still training a little, but Kenneth begins the next round, and the subject is a fence. So will you tell us something on that subject in the game, starting now? Many years ago, I got lots of bits of wood, nailed them together, and made myself a fence, which enclosed a charming little vegetable patch on which I also grew some fruit. And do you know people say, the lovely little fence, you painted it pink. What marvellous colour to stand out and matches your aforementioned fruits. I haven't repeated myself, you see. And this charming <laughs> gentleman who told me about putting the straw around to protect them, you see, helped me to obtain... Uh, Danny Nimmo, Charles. Revolution of you see. Yes, you did oh, say you said. Uh, footling. <laughs> well, it's more than one word on that occasion. Derek, there are 26 seconds to take over the subject of offence, starting now. When I went to the Nick recently, I visited a fence. He was been put there because he'd stolen a lot of property actually belonging to me. Some silver? Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Well, fences don't steal, you see. There are people that, uh, people who do steal, sell things to. On the contrary, when you're convicted, they say an aider and a better is a stealer. Because you've aided and abetting the theft, and therefore he's right when he says the stuff was stolen from me. Well, I bow to your experience. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> Your challenge was that the chap was in prison for yes. stealing yes. when he was a fence. Yes. So he would have been in prison for receiving as a fence, yes. which is a legitimate and clever challenge. Peter, you have the subject. Ah, There what are a 18 surprise. seconds on a fence starting now. Yes, well, the fence I made was of barbed wire because I was very anxious to keep out the Germans and doing my bit on the south coast in the last war. This fence, not a very attractive looking uh, arrangement of wire, it was... Um, Derek Nimmo, Charlotte. Two wires. I'm afraid we'd have the wire again, so Derek's got in with two and a half seconds on a fence starting now. I saw an old man sitting on a fence and I said, what, oh, how are you? <laughs> Once again, Derek Nimmo got the subject before the whistle and gained that extra point and has increased his lead. Uh, ahead of Peter Jones and Clement Freud and Kenneth Williams in that order. Peter, your turn to begin. The subject, naval displays. Will you tell us something about them in the game, <laughs> starting now? Well, mostly, I suppose, they're concerned with boats and ships messing about in the... This <laughs> <laughs> challenge, yes. I thought it was uh, pause, the hesitation. Oh, there was, there was, was pause, yes. yes. I don't give yes. you one of the subject, actually. There are 53 seconds for you to talk about naval displays, Kenneth, starting now. The finest naval display you would ever see is when I get out my naval, and I have <laughs> a 
very special thing which I got through the post called a belly button brush. And he does the job now. He's really getting into all the nooks and crannies. And I feel every bit of satisfied as knocking the head off a bottle egg and feeling that another nationalised industry has been returned to its rightful owners. Because after all, people have got no right to take these things over. The government step in. What does that mean to us? I don't blame them. I went over there. I said to one of them, you more power to your elbow, mate. I said, because as far as I'm concerned, the best thing they can all do is to down. <laughs> <laughs> Clement, why are you challenged? It was a long way away from naval displays. <laughs> yes, it was. He got as far as his elbow at one point. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Clement Freud has a legitimate challenge with four seconds to go on naval displays starting now. The whole fleet's lit up where the worms that... They were the words of that unfortunate commentator uh, who shall be nameless for obvious reasons. Clement Freud, you got that extra point and we're coming to the end of the round and the show, so let me give you the final score. Kenneth Williams, in spite of all that he contributed, finished in fourth place a little way behind Clement Freud, who was equal with Peter Jones, but they were both a little way behind this week's winner, once again, Derek Nimmo. We do hope you've enjoyed the programme this week and uh, want to tune in again when our regulars will be their normal ebullient selves. And until then, from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch.